panel for today's session. In the person of Professor Jean Marie Fenrich. Now, Professor Fenrich is the director of Special Project Africa at the Leitner Center for International Law and Justice at the School of Law, Fordham University in the USA. Professor Fenrich, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can hear you. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. So over to you then, if you can take it from here. Thank you. Wonderful. I have the great pleasure of moderating the third panel of the African Customary Law Conference. And this panel will address the very broad and interesting topic of customary law, human rights, and peace and security. And we are very fortunate to have five wonderful panelists. First, we will have Professor Joyerman, the Weinstein Chair of International Studies and Associate Provost for Faculty at the University of Richmond. And she will be discussing customary law and return migration after violent conflict. Professor Joyerman will be speaking of situations where people displaced from their homes or customary land due to conflict are able to return when the conflict ends and then face a host of challenging issues regarding property ownership, illegal occupation, and lack of or theft of records, among other challenges. Professor Joyerman will also consider the difficulties of compensation for lost property in settings with customary law and customary land tenure. Our next speaker is Professor Muna Ndulo, the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of International and Comparative Law and the Director of the Berger International Studies Programs at Cornell Law School. Professor Ndulo will be discussing the legally pluralist societies of post-colonial African states and the tension between certain human rights norms, such as gender equality and customary law. Professor Ndulo will then consider potential constitutional and other reforms to reconcile these bodies of law where there is conflict. We will then have Dr. Charles Kamala, senior lecturer at Africa Nazarene University Law School and Alexander Likaka, lecturer also at Africa Nazarene University who will discuss their paper on building security and respecting human rights through customary governance. More specifically, they will be discussing the role of non-state actors counter-radicalization programs in the fight against terrorism in Kenya, examining the models, processes, and perception of counter-radicalization programs and various legal and efficacy implications of surveillance. Our final panelists is Dr. Peter Anyango, senior lecturer at the School of Law at the University of Nairobi. And Dr. Anyango will be considering how Kenya's 2010 constitution treats customary law and legal traditions in Kenya, and will discuss the enforcement of customary law by the courts under the Judicature Act, and how the alternative justice system seeks to reinforce the gaps in the law. Each of our panelists will have 12 minutes to speak, and then we will have time for a question and answer period after all the panelists have made their initial remarks. So please make sure to use the chat function to put any questions in as they come up as the speakers are speaking and we'll address them all at the end. And Professor Joyerman is going to start us off. So thank you, Professor Joyerman. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I'm going to, I have a PowerPoint presentation so I'll be sharing my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Perfect, thank you. So uh, my name is Sandra Yorman. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Richmond. And I wanted to, um, I was very excited to see this uh, conference and wanted to take the opportunity to uh, address an issue that's been uh, of concern to me for some time. Um, I've been looking at uh, post-conflict property restitution in a number of contexts. And uh, I've been bothered by the fact that uh, so little international policy is adapted to customary law. Uh, so this presentation and the paper are informed by my field research in uh, Northern Uganda, in Liberia, but also in some non-African settings in Kosovo and Serbia as well. But I'm looking at this question of how can practices of property restitution 
and compensation in customary tenure systems best enable livelihoods for people who are displaced by violent conflict. I mean, I'm gonna do that uh, by talking briefly about customary law in settings with violent conflict, then talking about some of the advantages and challenges of return migration when you have customary law and customary land tenure. Then I'll talk a little bit about international policy on post-conflict property restitution and then get to this knotty issue of customary rights, return migration and livelihood choices. And rather than making some firm conclusions, I'm going to sort of present a set of questions that I think exist when we think about uh, customary law, customary tenure and return migration. So I, I wanna begin by just noting that Disputes over land and property after violent conflict, when you have an opportunity for return migration, that is not an African problem. It is not a customary law problem. It is a post-war problem. And right now we can see this in Europe where in places like Poland, you have legal cases over property restitution from World War II, which ended over 75 years ago. So I note this because uh, this issue of how customary law functions in post-conflict settings is a salient issue from the perspective of all of us who here find customary law of great interest, but it's also a salient issue from the perspective of post-war reconstruction and recovery more generally. So this is just a, a, a big concern across the board and within it, I think customary law and customary tenure is, has been under-considered. So um, I will say that we know quite a bit about customary tenure and some of the problems that we see in post-conflict settings in Sub-Saharan Africa because of the experiences of Mozambique, of Northern Uganda, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, so we've seen, you know, we have some documentation of, of where the problems lie when people return to customary tenure systems. Uh, but we don't know quite enough about the solutions and, and sort of best practices and, and which are the ways that uh, uh, customary law can be flexible and accommodating and where is it problematic. So sort of trying to come up with um, ideas about how to best facilitate, facilitate people's livelihood reconstruction in post-war settings is my primary concern. So we know that violence displaces people and it displaces them in a couple of ways uh, with a reactive and preventative displacement. Like if, if somebody comes and burns down your house, you might leave your area because you're just afraid that they're gonna come and kill you. But also if there's violence in your area, sometimes you just leave because you're afraid that it's going to come to you. So we have violence displaces people in a couple of ways, either because of direct impact or this indirect impact. And we know that when people leave areas that are perceived to be dangerous, often their land is usurped or um, taken over by others or sometimes abandoned. Um, now I'm highlighting this piece by uh, Adelaide and George, which is, pertains to Boko Haram. Um, and what they found was that uh, when, um, when as people left areas perceived to be dangerous in Nigeria and other areas where Boko Haram has uh, been active, other farmers took over their lands and expanded, uh, their, uh, expanded their farms and their holdings with those of their neighbors. I've also got a, a piece that I wrote with some of my students where we found that in Northern Uganda, after the conflict, when people returned, they didn't put their homes back in the same places. They put them back in different places. So uh, we know um, that uh, what happens during and after conflict is, is really quite different than sort of the, the way that land management, land use, um, and even where people were putting their homes. We know it's really different than before. And uh, we also know that people who are displaced by violence can be displaced for long periods of time. Uh, not everybody returns after conflict and children are often raised in places of refuge rather than in their home areas. So um, all of these things impact customary law and customary tenure when people begin to return. <laughs> So I think in practice, we have this sort of uh, an, a set of problems 
not everybody returns after conflict. The people, people don't always return to the same plot of land or the same homestead. Those that do return are impacted by their time in displacement, either by their ideas of who the appropriate leaders should be or their ideas of what appropriate livelihoods should be. Uh, so we have ample evidence of all these things in multiple contexts across Sub-Saharan Africa. So within all of this, there are some real advantages in when we think about return migration. There are advantages to customary law, and they are the advantages that we know um, pertain to customary law in, uh, in a variety of settings, right? That we, it's flexible, it's adaptable, and it's local. So the the flexibility um, is the lack of um, the lack of formalization can be a benefit. It can lead to the easy accommodation of refugees and displaced people in areas where they had not previously lived. We see this a lot in uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia, really facilitated by ECOWAS as well, where you know communities easily accommodated folks who didn't live there before. It's also adaptable. <laughs> Customary law can accommodate change and evolve. And this is widely viewed to be a positive quality in any legal system. Um, and in a, in a case of customary land tenure, it's even more important because you might not have records. Or, uh, so this evolutionary capacity of customary law is an advantage. But we also know that it's local. It's accessible in terms of proximity, language, and just, just the, the culture of customary law is something that most people are familiar with. So there are some real advantages to having customary law in areas of return migration. But there are also challenges. And I would say those challenges fall into four areas, uh, leadership, memory, land sales, and government. So just briefly on each of these, and you know, I could go into a lot more detail, but in terms of leadership, um, if the displacement is long, you know, in Northern Uganda, the displacement was 20 years and customary leaders can pass away. They can choose not to return. Sometimes in, uh, in uh, customary systems after violent conflict, people come back and declare themselves to be customary leaders when they weren't previously. Um, and often those people are armed combatants, right? They're, they're uh, asserting a different kind of power. And then also sometimes we see exploitation of the responsibilities of customary leaders, you know, who might perceive themselves to be owners of land rather than the guardians of it. So that's one set of problems. A second set of problems is, those, is that of memory, where again, in the case of long displacements, people forget where, where were the boundaries of their homesteads? What were the exact boundaries of the clan lands or the lineage land? And this is only exacerbated if the land has not been farmed and if the sort of the natural boundaries of fields and uh, trees have eroded or, or disappeared over time. People also forget what were the family agreements that were made over who gets what property, who's taking care of which children, those kinds of negotiations that occurred in families and then 20 years go by and you're trying to reestablish a life. It's, it's, it's a challenge, this lack of memory. The third area I, I just I like to highlight is land sales. Um, um, land sales are a problem in cases of return migration as people um, who don't want to farm will, will come back, reclaim their land and sell it uh, so that they can finance life somewhere else. We see this in Mozambique, we see this in northern Uganda, we see it in other places as well. And this is a problem if that then moves that land entirely out of the customary system. Also again, uh, customary leaders selling land um, that might not be theirs to sell. Uh, that's a second problem. Last, last set of problems I would note is that of the government, not governance, but the government, right? The governments in times of return migration can often also take advantage of the uncertainty to uh, give away lands to large and medium scale land acquisitions or embark on titling programs, which uh, unsettle a situation even further. Again, we see this in Burundi, we see this in Northern Uganda. So we have these challenges, settings of return migration. So when we look to international public policy on, um, on property restitution, there really are sort of two sets of guidelines. The first set, which is the Pinero principles, 
which were developed in 2005, really to handle post-conflict settings. And they, um, they are focused primarily on housing and they have a particular point of view, which is return that which was taken. You know, if you lost a house, you should get that house back. If you can't get that house back, you should be compensated for that house. So it's very specific. Um, the voluntary guidelines from 2012, um, they're focused on the management, the appropriate management of land more generally and agriculture more generally. Um, and, and they directly address customary tenure systems and do allow for the return of alternative parcels of land as compensation in um, post-conflict settings. However, both of these articulations of rights are, I would say, either very or slightly incongruent with the land holding realities of customary systems. So one point of dissonance is, for example, in the Pinero principles, noting rights to a specific and discrete property rather than a general right to the resources or a general claim on the resources of the community. So one problem, in both of them, there's also no understanding of presence as being necessary to have a rightful claim to the restitution of land or the comp you know, re reclaiming land that you, you, you need to be present. You, know, you, you have to be seen there as a part of the community. So in customary tenure systems, presence and timing are important. Land rights can accrue and diminish over time due to factors including presence, use, family circumstances, competing demands in the community. So there are, there's a way in which the international public policy just does not fit well with uh, customary tenure systems. So um, when we think about return to customary tenure systems, the, the, you know, sort of the, what we see is if you return home, you can reclaim land. If you don't return, you can't reclaim land. And this is not necessarily the best situation for everyone. Um, so I know I'm running out of time. Let me just get to my, my concerns about asset losses. Um, I have in the way in which our international sort of rights about property restitution don't agree with the customary rights, I think creates a, a, a kind of uh, highlights potential asset losses that can occur where those who don't return lose rights to their property, right? It also assumes, right, well, even if we think about the voluntary guidelines and the assumption is that uh, farming is the livelihood option of choice. And this is a, a challenge for young people who have been raised in refugee camps. They return and their only livelihood option is to farm where they have not been raised farming. So that's a real challenge, which can lead to a third challenge, which is this lack of alternatives can then encourage land sales in customary systems, which is all good if everybody's fine with that system transitioning to formal titled land. But if you want, the community wants to keep their system customary, then I think having land sales can be really potentially harmful to the system. Um, Fourthly, that people displaced as minors may not be aware of their family assets. They might lose their family assets because they're unable to assert competing claims against older relatives. And adding to this whole thing, <laughs> whole problem is that there's no, there's no international fund for the compensation of lost property in uh, war or in any conflict. So uh, let me end then with a, a couple of questions in lieu of a conclusion. When we think about trying to meet the livelihood needs of people who have been, been displaced by violent conflict, displaced from customary tenure systems, what is fair practice to address the livelihood needs of those who choose not to return after a violent conflict and therefore lose claim to their assets? That's one question. Related to that is this what might compensation for them actually look like in a customary tenure system? Uh, some people have suggested alternative programming, training and education. Um, that's an option, but it's also not clear what, if there's no land market, what the value of land might be, like 
what is appropriate compensation, what might that be? Um, and also, if you did give compensation, uh, what does that mean about group membership? Because compensation typically means that you renounce future resource claims in exchange for monetary payment. But in many Sub-Saharan African customary tenure systems, resource claims are contingent on group membership. Uh, for example, because I'm a Choli from a particular clan, I have a right to the land in a specific area. So if I have as, as an individual receive compensation in lieu of a land claim in a particular area, what then is my status as membership in that group, right? Uh, so I think that there are just a whole host of issues that are raised. All right, I'm gonna stop here and just sort of say, I know I um, what I have done here is really raise a set of questions and concerns that I have been wrestling with. And I really have valued the opportunity to present here in this context where I think I have a, a lot of folks who know a considerable amount about customary law and customary land tenure and can engage in a, in a robust conversation on the issue. So I'll stop there. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Professor Yerman. That was a very interesting discussion of a very thorny problem. So I too would be very interested to hear about any examples of places that have successfully addressed the issue because I'm imagining they're going to be hard to come by. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you for your uh, for opening up the third panel um, with such an interesting topic. And now we have Professor Indulo um, who's going to speak next about customary law and human rights. Thank you very much, uh, uh, moderator. And uh, thank you to UPSA University and uh, uh, Fordham University for organizing this uh, exciting uh, conference and uh, also for the uh, invitation. I, uh, so I'm going to try and um, address uh, two or three things, but I think the, the context in which I'm going to uh, address my topic is really uh, the one that I think uh, yesterday Professor Galizi brought out that uh, what we are dealing with is really legal, legal pluralism and that uh, although it is uh, you know acute in Africa it's not unique to Africa so I think that the, there is a, it's important to realize that because they when you do that then of course uh, you can look at comparative um, you know, literature in terms of what can be done uh, to solve the real issues that uh, come up uh, as a result of this uh, legal pluralism. Now, uh, first, I guess once you use that term, you have to sort of like try to define what you mean by legal pluralism. And I think here, basically, what I mean is a uh, is condition in which uh, a population observes more than one body of law. Uh, and uh, it's I think in this kind of definition, it's of the essence that even if it's plural, the various elements are all subject to the overriding law making process of the state. Uh, so that there is actually an ultimate authority that is governs the state. It's a sovereign state, but also it means that there is somebody, uh, it's not a lawless society uh, in terms of uh, governance. Now, I think legal pluralism poses a lot of challenges to, uh, to Africa. And I think a lot of them were identified in the, you know, in the first session that uh, we, we had. Uh, and I think uh, it's important to point out that uh, we tend to look at legal pluralism in Africa in terms of the common law and customary law. That's actually not the experience of a lot of countries. It's true that a lot of countries are common law. But for example, in the region I come from, I come from uh, in Southern Africa. Actually, the common law is a the minority there. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the predominant kind of foreign law system in Southern Africa, it's actually Roman and Dutch. You know, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia, uh, Swaziland, they're all Roman and Dutch. So the, 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 the Extent of Application Act that we talk about in the context of common law systems, uh, there it was actually uh, Cape Province uh, law that was applied to these uh, countries. And Cape Province, of course, had the Roman and Dutch law. So it, actually in Southern, the only really sort of common law countries are Zambia and Malawi. Uh, but of course, what's interesting 
is that these countries have been together at various times, including the fact that uh, uh, three of them from different legal systems were one country for a long time. You know, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi until 1963 uh, were governed by the same courts, by the same everything. And those courts were navigating all these uh, systems and still continue to uh, do so. Uh, now, I think we noted that in the colonial period, of course, the customer law was uh, 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 administered by the, you know, the traditional uh, system. Uh, but I think once we look at the pluralism, we must also not just look at the substantive law. Uh, we have to also to realize that uh, the, along with this uh, formalistic dualism between the common law or Roman and Dutch and customer law, uh, there were vast functional and procedural disparities uh, between the two systems or two or three systems, you know, in terms of uh, the procedures they followed, in terms of uh, the informality of the processes. Uh, some would argue the uh, council law systems were more conciliatory and all that. So we have to look at not just the substantive law, but there's also actually the procedural aspects that were uh, uh, different. Uh, now, so for a long time, these systems, I mean, we know how the, the common law or whatever received law was introduced, how it treated the, uh, the, com the customary law. Customary law continued to apply, but only subject to certain conditions, you know, often not conflicting with legislation or repugnance, which was discussed uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, now, it also maintains it maintained a dual court system. But at independence, it's quite remarkable that uh, the African countries, uh, starting with the Ghana and Kroma, talked about how you cannot have two different courts, there has to be one. All of them integrated the courts, but integrated, the integration was not actually in substantive terms. The, they created one court system, but they brought the customer law courts at the bottom of the system. So in a way, they still continue to be somewhat a little bit uh, different. So in Zambia, they, you, you named them different names, like you know, cast, you know, local courts or primary courts in Tanzania. But the, effectively, the integration was uh, not really relating to trying to deal with the substance or even the procedures, but just bringing the courts under uh, the uh, what was seen as the Western system courts, and they became part of that. And it's true also that. Uh, Customer law continues to be uh, the main law that's applied by African uh, communities. Uh, but I think that uh, we must also recognize that there is social change taking place. And the, these are dynamic societies. You know, there is a private capital growing. There is all sorts of things going on. Uh, there's mining. And I think you know my colleague who just finished has been talking about land. I mean, this, this is it's a huge problem in terms of land grabbing. Uh, so you cannot talk about customer law as if it is actually static, that it's there and in its pure form and all that. Uh, now, I think yesterday we heard that the, uh, the colonial period gave us two systems in terms of the official law and the, the uh, you know, the, uh, what is called customer law. And I think, again, there, it varies in terms of the impact. And I would argue that, for example, in places like South Africa, the impact was much greater than in a country like Ghana in terms of developing the official law. Uh, because of course, of the fact that uh, you had much more intensive colonial uh, settlement. And as a result, it's not the same thing in terms of actually the impact. It's true, you can talk generally about official customer law and you know, customer law, but the impact, I think one has to be uh, interrogate that to see how it actually plays out in different uh, uh, countries. Uh, now, so now coming to the question of, um, uh, so my position of course is uh, that, you know, uh, we have a system, we have systems, but we must take into account the social change I not pretend that customer law is, exists in its pure uh, form. Now, the, <clears throat> the next issue to me is this question of uh, the debate over customer law and the rights, human rights uh, debate. Uh, 
I would argue that uh, it's wrong to see human rights as a Western concept. I think that's giving the West too much. I mean, I don't agree that actually the West invented human rights. If anything, history teaches us that the West has been the greatest violator of human rights. You know, they had uh, apartheid, they had slavery, they had colonialism, genocide. So it's not, they're not the owner. So I think we all have to claim that, that it's an African concept, it's a human concept. And, and I think the approach from the Universal Declaration is the right one, that you know, every human being you know, uh, bears his rights. In addition, if you look at uh, Southern Africa, the liberation struggles were actually premised on the claim of human rights. So you just have to go to Mandela's speech at the Livonia trial. That's what he says. You know, uh, and the, there is no claim that actually the rights are not coming from you know, somewhere else. And I think also we must accept that customer is a good system, but every system has problems, you know, and there are things that need to be changed in systems. And I recall a very dramatic, uh, uh, you know, uh, incident in Zimbabwe. And the, I don't know whether uh, Professor Guda is here from Ghana. Well, in 2012, when we were, we were attending a meeting in this Zimbabwe workshop where we trying to work out this uh, Zimbabwe constitution, 2012. And there was a discussion about uh, customer law and about you know, how we need to go back to this. And the, there was a Professor Makumba, he was very quiet for a while. Uh, and then they asked him, what, what, what do you think about this topic? And he says, look, do you see me? I'm an albino, you know? And I don't want to hear this thing that African customer law was not pure says, if you look at Shona customer law, and I'm Shona, I'm not supposed to exist. So, I mean, we have to accept that there are certain things that needed to change and need to change even today. And it's not unique to customer law. Uh, whether you're talking about the common law, you're talking about civil law, there are issues uh, that needed to be changed. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, so then uh, the question then, once we accept that there is change, there's need for change, uh, is look at, uh, you know, how do we come, how do we do this? What kind of instruments, what kind of tools do we have to try and uh, uh, change uh, this, uh, 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 accommodate the change that's necessary? Now we, we note that, for example, if you look at the constitutional development, the independence constitutions were not good for, change in the area of human rights, especially women's rights, because the Lancaster model, which is the British model of the constitution, which they gave to all former British colonies, actually humanized customer law from scrutiny. Sorry? Oh, immunized customer law in terms of human rights. So, but post uh, 1989, the democratization period, the South African constitution, the Kenya constitution, Uganda constitution, we see a different approach in the sense that uh, we, the, those constitutions recognize customer law and put it on the same level as the common law, but then subject it like common law. Common law itself is also subject to the constitution. So it's subject all laws. And that goes to the point that I was making that you pluralism, but then you have to accept that there's actually a state that is overriding in terms of uh, the interests of the state. So in terms of uh, reform, therefore, there's one uh, tool is of course, uh, what was talked about yesterday as a uh, uh, living law. Uh, and that's true that I think that he, uh, you know, we have to look at customer law as a living law, but we must also recognize that living law has its limits because you are talking about a community and you have to define what kind of community you're talking about and the ability of that community to actually change. Uh, but also don't forget that those communities themselves are, are not exempt from the impact of colonial rule in terms of what we claim in terms of uh, you know, official law, because they're also kind of like official societies where patriarchy was promoted by the colonial systems. So of course, the, there are limits to that. Uh, and I think cost, you know, the question of uh, living law is a good tool, but you must also accept that there are limits to it. 
and of course, in the context of uh, other systems, I think that I would argue that even the common law has that concept in the sense that no law can survive if it's static. It has to change. The common law changes, and that's why it has survived. Uh, so that's one uh, strategy. I mean, the second strategy, I think, so the first strategy I would say is the constitutional option, which I think we must clarify in all constitutions that, you know, in fact, uh, customer law is the same status as the common law or the civil law, but unlike civil law and the common law are all subject to the constitution. The second strategy is the courts. Uh, now, I mean, I think the courts, are good instruments, you know, in terms of change, but there are limits again there. Uh, in terms of, of course, if you look at the uh, common law method, you would have to wait for precedents, you have to wait for cases to go to court, and the many of the people that are affected by customer law don't have the means to actually go to uh, present these cases to uh, to the uh, the courts. So you have those limits uh, in terms of uh, using the uh, the, uh, the court uh, system. That's not to say that we shouldn't use the courts. I'm just recognizing that it's an option, but that uh, as we consider that option, we must also remember that there are limits to it. Uh, and even the question of living law, in the end, it would have to be recognized by either legislation adopting it or by a court precedent. So, and you see that in South Africa in terms of the Bay case in terms of the, uh, you know, Shua case about chiefs, about women uh, inheriting uh, chieftainship, where they argued that the, the custom had changed because of living law, but then it had to be recognized at some level by an authoritative agency in terms of the, uh, uh, the courts. Now, the other option, of course. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Ndulo, I'm sorry, I'm uh, being prompted to remind everyone to, um, in terms of timing, um, mm. to try to keep to time so everyone has a, a chance to speak. And, and I, of course, had the great pleasure of reading your entire paper and am very interested to hear about the reforms that you're proposing to reconcile the, the different bodies of laws. I know everyone else is um, who's working on customary law issues and the challenges that that poses. But if you mm. could try to summarize, um, just so we'll have time yeah. for questions and answers. Yeah, I'm about to summarize, actually. I'm, Thank you. My watch, too. So. I've got a little bit. Uh, I mean, the problem yesterday they were given 15 minutes, so I actually assumed. Yes. That yes. So that's why I was. Uh, so uh, I think to. So basically, then uh, what I'm trying to say is that you have that option. And the third option is, of course, legislation. Uh, and in my view, legislation is appropriate in some situations, uh, especially when you're trying to make comprehensive uh, uh, reform. Uh, you cannot do comprehensive reform through living law. Uh, or court systems. So I think you have to consider that as a, uh, an option that uh, should be uh, used. And now I think that as we use these options, and that would be my, the last point that I would like to, to make, uh, we have to first, I think, as we try to reform customer law using, say, for example, legislation, that one of the guides uh, that we ought to be promoting is a study of uh, the values that uh, you know the customer law represents because we want those values to be reflected in the laws that we are adopting. My problem with the trying to insist that customer law should remain the way it is is that it becomes the law of the ghetto. You know, like Seidman used to say, the law of the reserves it's for poor people because then people are always graduating out of it and actually ignoring it. But if we take the values from there and include them in the legislation, then the African legal system will actually be uh, enriched. So I think with my time over, I will stop there. And uh, I just encourage you to, I was going to talk about traditional authority and all that, but I think that's okay. We can talk about that in, in our discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ndulo. And I look forward to the question and answer period to ask you more about the legislative proposals and constitutional reforms that you think might be effective, because it's uh, very interesting. Um, so our, our next speakers together, we have Drs. Kamala and Lakaka, who are going to be together <laughs> presenting a pa their paper on building security and respecting human rights, um, uh, specifically in Kenya. 
And um, if you could try to um, keep to the 12 minute mark, I'm being reminded um, myself to try to save time for questions at the end. Um, so I'm not sure how Dr. Kamala and Likaka, how you want to proceed, but um, either of you can start uh, if you'd like to now. Professor Fenrich, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. <laughs> Um, we, we, we intend to proceed as follows. We're dividing our time equally. I will speak for six minutes. My colleague will speak for six minutes. My role will be the theoretical part. My colleague will provide empirical evidence. I want to make six points and I'll try to make them succinctly and quickly. The paper is entitled Building Security and Respecting Human Rights Through Customary Governance. Our focus is on the law of terrorism more specifically, the law of radicalization, criminalizing, persuading um, people who hold extreme beliefs and try to create violence for political, religious, or social change, the criminalization of imparting, uh, holding a, a radical belief. And the aim of the paper is to show that Terrorism law has evolved over time, and now the fight against terrorism can only be won in the hearts of minds of potential terrorists if um, they are stakeholders in the state and in society. That is the thrust of the argument. Um, and that it can be won using customary law and uh, a sense of belonging while fighting uh, um, radicals. So, very quickly, I begin by um, explaining why retributive justice cannot be successful against terrorism, because first of all, you don't want the crime to already be committed. The effects are so catastrophic. And it's only successful if the terrorist suicide bomber dies. So we don't want to use retributive justice. We want to use preventive justice. And yet, in using preventive justice, surveillance has its limits. Um, we want to provide safety for and security for citizens, but without intruding into their privacy. So the problem is created because how are we going to respect the human rights of everybody if we, as uh, Edward Snowden did, um, um, if, if, if the state goes into everybody's email and everybody's uh, uh, electronic communication, then none of us will be enjoying our lives. We are entitled to privacy. And the Kenyan constitution, Article 31, protects the right to privacy. And therefore, the state is limited in the kind of surveillance it can do. Um, in African customary law, Jomo Kenyatta wrote in his book that there was the idea of collective responsibility. Um, it's a controversial idea because unlike Western the whole family will pay, for example. Um, I'll explain how it works, but it's a, it's, it's a valid way of engaging a, a certain age group or age set in responsibility for knowing, because they know who is the troublemaker, who is the infractor. So if anybody may, uh, uh, creates a problem, you will all be punished. I'll show you how it works. If there's a breach of promise to marry, the family of the man who promised to marry will have to pay uh, uh, the bride's family. Um, in in, uh, uh, in, in large-scale conflicts, like in Uganda, for 25 years, the Acholi people prefer what is called mato oput, drinking the bitter fruit or, 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 or the, of a tree. And basically, it is compensation based to restore social harmony. But it, it works as an alternative to retributive justice. That's the point. Um, so our aim is to compare the two systems, how the state actors respond to radicalization and non-state actors. And my colleague has done a study on how non-state actors uh, engage in counter-radicalization problems within Nairobi. Um, I myself have looked at the transformation of terrorism laws, how they first began by denial. Kenya refused to enact any radicalization laws, any, any anti-terrorism laws, because we thought it was a Western problem. Until we slowly enacted uh, duties to inform about money laundering. Then defined terrorist acts in 2012. And now in 2014, 
we included radicalization as a new act, uh, as a new crime, but most specifically about this study, there's a bill before parliament which intends to impose omissions responsibility on any institutional administrator who fails to report um, radicalization within schools, whether it's a nursery school until a university, and that is the approach that the state is using. Institutional administrators have are liable for failing to report. Um, so without going to the details, I explain what uh, preventive justice is all about and how it's the law, criminal law is actually based on preventive justice in the UK. However, it has been uh, transformed by the elites to prefer retributive justice, prosecution, conviction, and protection of human rights in that process. When the criminal law was imported into Africa, it ousted the whole African customary law, criminal law. And it has remained that way to date. It is repugnant to justice as mor uh, and morality. However, um, we make the case that in terms of informing uh, uh, about potential recruitment of ter uh, terrorism by Al-Shabaab, which is a problem in Kenya, it is advantageous to rely on close-knit societies to uh, inform. Since the courts have rejected um, the use of surveillance, unless there are credible rumors about who the, 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 the um, uh, uh, suspects are, then you can intercept their communications. I'll elaborate on that in question time, but let my colleague uh, continue with our hypothesis where we claim that um, there is a role to be played by customary law in uh, um, incorporating non-state actors uh, to against the offense of radicalization. Thank you very much. Mr. Likaka, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Thanks for the opportunity for my senior who has already spoken about uh, um, our topic. Yeah, my role is actually to explain the findings. In our methodology, we actually used a mixed method approach where we applied both uh, qualitative and quantitative in terms of actually getting sentiments and concerns in testing the hypothesis whether the actors have actually have a use clearly when you look at it from African customer. The non-state actors, indeed, they have a strong role to play, particularly if you look at the kinds of elders who play a role in ensuring that the society remains neat and safe. So from the perspective where we are seeing that in during initiation and the transition of the young men into adulthood, the customary law comes in very quickly in terms of actually transferring the values, the norms, and the folklore, and this is a transition where you are taught values on right to life and respect for human life. So we feel in our findings, we found that actually they will play a critical role in ensuring that actually they de-radicalize because the youth therefore will have lost the value because of the changing social dynamics and the destruction of the social fabric that we have. Then you find that youth are actually getting recruited into uh, radical groups and uh, other related groups that actually cause crime. Our design, was actually to look at um, uh, sentiments expressed by specific non-state actors. This one, we looked at the kinds of elders, we looked at the religious uh, leaders, we also looked at the community-based groups that are actually striving or working very hard to ensure that youth who have actually returned, who have been demilitarized, that have come back to Kenya, then they could be assisted to settle. But then the role of African customer law, we find it comes in strongly that the social fabric that has been destroyed, the social fabric that actually affecting the youth because of the changing dynamics, because of modernization, then it is important that actually we adhere to it and if we use the same as an entry point in handling uh, uh, radicalized youth, we can actually be able to achieve. The second point was actually those ones that we are handling, for example, religious leaders. We found out that actually they play a role because there's a, there's a blend of customary law and how it blends very well with the religion, particularly if you look at the Catholic. And we felt in our findings that fine, then this could actually again be used in explaining or helping the youth who have been radicalized to actually adjust 
We also, in terms of liability, we can customize, which could actually impose the vicarious liability. And the, these are some of the things that we are looking at when we look at some of the programs that are being initiated by, that have been initiated by the government, particularly community policing. And we have a concept in Kenya where um, 10 households come together and then they have collective responsibility to actually care for the youth or the care for everybody within the community. And we felt that actually within the same, they're actually guided by African values. They're guided by neighborhood, the ujama, the kind of neighborhood that can actually make ensure that they are safe. We also found out that the new form of terrorism that we is ideologically um, persuasion in terms of the youth that are facing and how then can we use the African customer law in terms of providing alternative socioeconomic um, livelihood for this marginalized youth who actually are easily or predisposed to radicalization. And therefore we found that the role of African customer law in terms of providing security, how are they, how are the youth trained or how the society and the other need together based on African customer law in terms of security, in terms of values. The study concludes that actually there's a strong correlation and the, the encouragement of social inclusivity is actually adhered to comfortably when you look at customary practices, particularly in relation to radicalization programs that our study sought. Again, we found out that uh, the police or the security providers will actually help to de-radicalize de or uh, adjust this by working with the religious leaders. And with this one, it's actually going to help uh, if they actually come from a perspective of African values in terms of uh, protection of human life. And of course, this one we are looking at in, in relation to the prevention of terrorism bill, which we already have uh, in our parliament. And therefore, in our conclusion, we find a strong basis for African customer law to be used in modern programs that can actually adjust and help youth to adjust with challenges they're facing, particularly radicalization. I thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. And thank you also for being so good about timing, because I know there's so much to, um, to address in each of these topics. And, uh, and I really appreciate that. Um, Professor Anyango, we're happy to see you on now. Um, Thank you. Yes, yeah, so it's um, it's good to see you. And if you could take it away with your remarks, hopefully then we'll still have some time for questions afterwards. No problem. Can I carry on? Oh, okay. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Where it depends on where you find yourself. Actually, uh, I was planning to project uh, a PowerPoint in this regard. Um, just a second or some, some few seconds so that I get it up if I'm able. If not, then are you able to see it? Doc, you'd actually have to try again, but you should be able to project. Kindly okay. share your screen. All right, let me do that straight away. Oh. Is it visible now? Not yet, Doc. Okay, I'm trying, I'm struggling with the technology. <laughs> no problem. Not yet? Um, unfortunately, no. Perhaps you may have to go ahead and then we'll send you some guidance on how to do that in the course of your presentation. Thank you. I think, I think. Okay, let me just carry on now. Okay, first and foremost, thanks so much uh, to the organizers that have uh, been able to put this conference together. It is in appreciation to revisit the question of the African customer law and its future, especially in Africa. But also it is equally important to look uh, at certain concerns uh, when it comes to its enforcement. So I have uh, uh, intentionally chosen to look at the avenues of uh, the enforcement of the African customary law, looking at the constitution of the Republic of Kenya, which has been widely accepted as progressive document, and which of course 
all of us, we are proud. However, still, this doesn't limit our concern as uh, scholars and academics and intellectuals in the area of law to look at what would appear as certain gaps or lacuna ledges. However, still, we need to begin with the constitutional assumptions. I'm so much concerned with the way the African customary law has been treated all along the constitutional document. Beginning with the preamble, we, the people of Kenya, is putting emphasis on the fact that we are a people. However, still, we move forward to see what, what do we intend by the people. Do we intend the Africans or the citizens with the African descent living in Kenya or those who are born in Kenya? Of course, the Constitution provides for the citizenship and the entitlement through registration or naturalization. However, still, we see the intention of the constitution to disregard the status and the presence of the African customary law of not mentioning the word African. Of course, uh, under Article 2, uh, sub-Article 4, it is provided that any law, including African customary law, that is not consistent with this constitution is it shall be void. And uh, having this in mind, when we talk about customer law as distinct from a specific category of law or traditional legal regime, such as the African customer law, my presumption is that there is a, a hypothetical assumption of the constitution not to focus the attention on the African customary law, but leaving it at the general perspective of customary laws, because there are many customary laws within Kenya, depending on the ethnic groups and communities that are existing. But when we talk about the African customs law, we must have uh, a clear focus and distinction so that we know its collocation within the laws of Kenya. The same constitution is taking us under Article 48 to the access to justice, that all Kenyans shall access justice. And if any uh, payment or any fee is considered, then it will be reasonable and within the law. Then this one takes me again to look at the coverage of Article 159 on the judicial authority and the judiciary is mandated to be in charge of what I would call, quote unquote, the African customary law. However, still, this does not appear, as I said, because under Article 159, sub Article 2, we see that the judicial authority shall be guided by the following principles. So it is not a rule, but a principle, which of course under sub sub article C is stated clearly in terms of the reconciliation, arbitration, mediation, including the traditional dispute resolution mechanisms. And this within quote is another constitutional assumption that traditional dispute resolution mechanisms uh, should envisage the African customary law or the African customary judicial system, which I find another assumption. Another assumption it comes under sub article three, that is article 159 sub article three, in which the African customary law, and here it is customary law, is seen from its negative presentation, in which the repugnancy to justice and also the morality are covered, just as though the African customary law should be seen or portrayed as repugnant or as against or contra bonus mores in which we find that that negation in itself 
uh, tries to weaken the constitutional protection of the enforcement of the African customer law. But bringing it down to, to downsize it, the Judicature Act, uh, Chapter 8 of the Laws of Kenya under Section 3, again revisits the African customary law, but only this is this legal sanctuary in which the African customary law is regarded as the African customary law other than just the general customary law. Under the Marriage Act, we find that the customary marriages are recognized by the statute. Well, having the constitution and the statutes uh, that are supposed to bring together the entire traditional regime known to us as the African customer law, we find that more is expected from the judiciary or the judicial authority, in this case, the courts and the tribunals. We find another hitch, and this is what I call the lacuna, because who is to decide which practice within the African customary law is repugnant or it is bonus mores? This is left to the honorable judges and the wisdom of the court and the practicing advocates to see to it that what is practiced out there is within the expectation of the justice system and also the morality. But we have had a case of the Republic versus Ado, Ado Mohammed in Kenya, in which it was a criminal offense. The accused had committed murder. But during the proceedings at the High Court of Garissa, it was reported that the accused uh, called the attention of the prosecutor claiming that the dispute had already been settled and it was done through the traditional dispute resolution mechanism of that particular community in which the witnesses were awarded in some sort of money or animals. However, my question is from the scholarly perspective, how can we account for the quality justice? How can we assess such kind of traditional dispute resolution mechanisms just to be sure that one cannot commit a crime of that category, of that nature, and get away with the crime? This is where we find the problem with the way the Constitution is. In addition, and drawing closer to my conclusion, I'm looking at what would be considered the accountability system. Within the Constitution, there is nothing such as traditional authority, which is provided for as comparatively we can uh, compare and contrast with other constitutions of the African sovereign states, uh, such as Uganda, the Republic of South Africa, Malawi, in which the traditional authority is protected and promoted within the constitution. In Kenya, within the constitution of the Republic as it is uh, now, there is nothing that is showing such accountability at law and at justice when it comes maybe to the practice of the customary law. This is where I find that we African jurists and scholars in the area, we need to be very proactive and engage ourselves in writing and publishing documents on the African customary law, just to build a robust uh, African jurisprudence as I have gathered from my, uh, my friend, Professor Munondulo, that the pl pluralistic system is creating a lot of problems, especially within such republics as Kenya, in which the population is mixed up. We cannot tell whether the African customer law will only concern communities and ethnic groups that have been identified by the state as uh, maybe as Africans 
and uh, others as non-Africans. So there is a kind of uh, changing dynamics within the political arena, the judicial arena, as well as the social fabric of the entire Kenyan society. I do think that much is yet to be done and we must uh, get ourselves into writing and carrying out pragmatic research so that we'll uh, abate the judicial authority with some information and point of reference when it comes to the African customary law regime. Otherwise, without which, we will again get into the problem or the hitch of the accountability at law. So such assumptions have created concern. I've done a write-up, which I will share with the organizing committee of this conference. And uh, I want to stop here and raise my case so that we can deliberate on such concerns. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Onyango. And so I have been informed by the powers that be that we have a few minutes for question and answers, even though we have gone over. I think we have shown that an hour is not sufficient time for such interesting speakers and remarks. Um, we do have some questions coming in in the Q&A and I would encourage everyone else to use that feature for any questions for our panelists. I'm gonna take the opportunity as moderator to ask the first question. Uh, if that's okay, and it's for Professor Mdulo. Uh, Professor Mdulo, I was wondering when you were making your remarks about different reforms for um, how to reconcile customary law when it um, doesn't agree with the um, human rights law, and you had mentioned legislation or constitution, but I wondered, have you thought about specific legislation that would still allow customary law to remain the living customary law that's adaptable in the way that we know it, as opposed to places where they tried to codify the customary law and it's turned out then to be largely ignored because it's not really the customary law of the people. Uh, okay. So um, I don't think, um, you know, I see uh, a problem in terms of if you look at the approach in Kenya, the approach in uh, South Africa, the key issue about customer law was to first elevate it to the same level as uh, the received law so that you recognize it when you talk about sources of law of Kenya that it includes customer law. So, that's uh, the first point. The second point that, in my view, all laws are living laws. I mean, laws, even the common law. If you look at even the marital rep in uh, the common law, it has evolved through the, the court system. So it changes. Every, every society changes the law. So it's a tool. And we mustn't look at living law as the only tool, because customer law is not static. And no law in the world is static. They all respond to society. So that would be my view that, you know, uh, and the, the only thing that I, I, I would insist is that if you have uh, a, a constitution like Kenya and all that, you cannot exempt customary law from being subject to the constitution in terms of the Bill of Rights. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, it's inconsistent with actually, I mean, the social contract with the state that you're going to run the state on this basis. So equality, customary law cannot be exempt from, from that. Yeah, and I think it's good for customer law. Uh, and that's why I think the key is to get the values so that I think as uh, my friend Peter here has been saying, get the values and it becomes part of the mainstream law. And that way you ensure that it survives because otherwise it will be law for poor people. You know? Yeah, I, hope, I don't know, I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> Thanks. As well as one can in two minutes on a, on a panel <laughs> issue. Um, Professor Yurman, I see that you are um, back with us also. And I wondered, given the complexity of your issue, do you have any models or places that you've seen that you think have handled this issue as well as can be expected that other places could look to? You know, it's a good question. I think that um, there are pieces of it that have been well handled in certain places. So um, I think that in in northern Uganda, after they got over sort of the initial sort of conflicts over lands and boundaries, we did see the customary dispute settlement systems 
um, really kick into gear and start um, actively resolving conflicts in a way that was helpful. And they also developed a kind of um, um, collective understanding about what to do with uh, particularly young people who wanted to sell their land um, and move it out of the customary system. Uh, I, it was not easy. I think it grieved a lot of people because they allowed them to do it um, and, and, and to create sort of to, to get the money for uh, to start a life in the city doing something else. So uh, it was it, it was difficult. It, it forced transition on the customary tenure system. Um, but it did evolve, right? <laughs> it, uh, it did do what we know it can do. Um, however, it, it, it took time and it really took uh, working through that initial period of massive, massive disputes over what were the boundaries, who owned what, who should be where. Um, so I think that that, and, and the Northern Uganda case was very similar to Mozambique where mass displacement, people move home and you just tremendous conflicts everywhere. So I think that to some degree, we've learned to anticipate that, right? That that's going to happen. And uh, the customary dispute resolution systems can work, but they often don't work immediately. It often takes, you know, three, two, three years for them to sort of get going again and transition and function, but then they can work. So I, I do think that there are some interesting lessons to be learned. Um, and some, so, so we're not without knowledge on this. Great. And I have a, one question that we've gotten in the Q&A. This is for all of the speakers. Um, and so the question is that um, the person who notes that nation, national constitutions have eradicated the existence of customary law in many ways and they view it as just existing as a figurehead. And they've asked that given the importance of customary law and bringing back respect for land value and rightful owners, what is the mechanism that the panel proposes to bring its existing, uh, the customary law existence to the core of the constitution and to be practiced in national courts? So I'm not sure if, if um, who would like to take this um, this question. Okay, yeah, just briefly. The, I mean, the question of land, as I, I think has been uh, uh, explained, is a very challenging uh, uh, issue. Uh, uh, but I, I think that uh, the it's one area where there's so much, you know, change because of economic changes, and the, uh, and I think what we need to do again is to see what are the values in customer law, land ownership that can be useful, and then how do we promote them so that they actually save uh, the communities. I mean, one of the we, one of the other problems, if you look at uh, this land grabbing, uh, land grabbing problem, customer law is actually being abused by chiefs to alienate massive land on the basis that, you know, the, it's the communal, I'm the chief, I'm the owner. In South Sudan, you can Google this case where a chief sold land the size of Connecticut, and he had to flee his area because the, the villagers discovered he had signed all these concessions uh, and using customer law. So, and that's the question then is how do we preserve that good aspect of a communal ownership uh, so that it's not abused in this kind of case? Yeah, and I think we need to look at that uh, from that perspective. I don't think constitutions have abolished customer law because I think the challenge at independence was to bring the status of customer law to the same level as received law, because it was inferior, you know, uh, and the constitution sort of like Kenya says, the sources of Kenyan law are the following. So then of course it's up to us as legal analysts, as judges to make sure that this is implemented. Would any of the other speakers like to answer that as well? Uh, maybe I can I'll so come up to you. After, go oh. first, Professor. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question of uh, the way forward or the mechanism that uh, I would personally propose is uh, the idea of coming up with the codification of the African customary law. Uh, those are the existing laws or the living customary law among communities 
uh, in a way that will have uh, some treaties and uh, documents that would uh, guide the legislature and the judiciary because uh, the failure to have some documentation will always keep the customary law unpredictable and that is uh, the cause for so many mis misrepresentations and people sometimes tend to manipulate that to justify their wrongs and this may not be good neither for the development of the customary law nor for uh, the justice system thank you dr kamala yes uh, perhaps the only contribution that i would make is at a substantive level um it's what uh, professor dulo has been saying we need to take our values and our ideas seriously to the extent that it, we are not necessarily inferior if we rely on Ubuntu as a concept of human nature. Human beings by nature are collective and we don't have to be ashamed of that so that um, if I, I know it in other areas, I can speak about land a little bit, but for sure, in terms of the family, when we give children responsibilities, it's not necessarily child labor. Or when we... Um, say that um, somebody belongs to the community, it's not in, a, an, an ex in fact, we may take it that it's even superior to the right to privacy because privacy is good, but it's not superior to the right to life. If we need to derogate from privacy to save lives, uh, we have to say that that's what African values are about and it's a good thing. Lastly, about land, I know a practice in Mombasa where people don't sell land, they only sell the structure to the land. And people buy, they only buy the structure to the land. And so land remains with its communal owner perpetually. It's something that is not in the statute books, but it seems to work on the ground. So again, what uh, 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 Dr. Nyango is saying seems that we need to somehow put it in, the, in print so that we know what those activities are all about. Yes, thank you for the question. And thank you for your very interesting answers. I'm afraid I'm being told that we need to wrap up as we're over time now. And I'm just sorry we don't have more time to engage with all of you on these very interesting and challenging issues. Um, and so hopefully we will be able to somehow find the remarks that you've all, and maybe we could ask the conference organizers if there's a way to share the remarks that everyone has submitted to the broader group so we can get a, a fuller understanding of different people's research. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much to the moderator for efficient moderation and great leadership. <laughs> thanks. And to the other panelists, thank you very thank much you for so the much. Yeah. So much. And thanks to our panelists too. Thank thanks. You. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Indeed, um, Professor Indulo has said exactly what I was about to say. I was about to congratulate uh, Professor Fenrich for such mm -hmm. excellent moderation. I mean, your deep knowledge of the issues raised by our presenters is very admirable. Congratulations. And uh, of course, to Professor Joriman, Professor Indulo, Dr. Kamala, and Mr. Likaka, and of course, Dr. Onyango. Thank you all so much for the wonderful work done. Thank you. Yes, so we have actually gotten to a part of our discussion that I personally have been so excited about. Um, traditional leaders being the custodians of customary law, it's clearly very important that we engage them in platforms or discussions such as these. So the next part of this conference is actually a discussion with traditional leaders on African customary law. And to lead us in this regard, as the moderator, we have Professor Paolo Galizzi, uh, my very own boss, whom I have come to admire so much for his hard work and his deep knowledge of customary law, among other areas of law. Now, Professor Galizzi is a clinical professor of law, as well as the director of the Sustainable Development Legal Initiative and the Corporate and Social Responsibility Program at the Leitner Center for International Law and Justice. Professor Galizzi, over to you, if you can hear me. And Thank you, Gertrude. And I don't know who is the boss. I think I respond to <laughs> the other way around. 
thank you, everybody. Uh, one thing that I would like to say is that, you know, we definitely must organize another conference because I heard from the previous panelists and I just want to hear more and more. And Professor Ndulo, I'm going to borrow something that you said about human rights, that we shouldn't let the West take credit for them. And I give credit to you for that particular quote. But now we are delighted to have two prominent traditional leaders with us to just begin a conversation about African customary law with those that really administer it, practice that in their daily life. And we are extremely lucky to have first uh, Nana Professor SKB Asante, one of the most prominent chiefs in Ghana. And Nana Professor SKB Asante is a Ghanaian lawyer and is the paramount chief of Asokore Asante in the Ashanti region. He was an international arbitrator and served as at the University of Ghana. Um, Nana Professor SKB Asante really doesn't need much more introduction because if I gave you, sir, credit for all that you've done, we will need all this conference and then we need to organize another one. So we're very honored to have you with us and we look forward to hearing your thoughts. And equally grateful, we're really delighted to have uh, Honorable Chief Fortune Charumbira, he is the president of Zimbabwe's Chiefs Council and is also the vice president of the Pan-African Parliament. Um, Honorable Chief Charumbira has been the president of the National Council of Chiefs in Zimbabwe for 16 years. He's been the traditional chief of the Charumbira dynasty since 1991. He's, as I said, the vice president of the Pan-African Parliament. And again, for you as well, we could be here for a long time to talk about all your achievement and we're delighted to have you both. Now, let's start this conversation and the idea is that I will pose general questions to both of you, but of course, feel free to elaborate on anything that you would like to share with us. And then what we will do, we will have uh, questions from the audience for about 10 minutes. Let me start with the first question. Yesterday, Professor talked about customary law and uh, in his presentation, he said customary law was the law of Africa, is the law of Africa, and we continue to be the law of Africa, or probably one of the laws in Africa. What is your view on the status of customary law, reflecting on the past and looking at the future? And we can start with you, uh, Professor Nana SKB Asante. Sorry, sir, we need, you need to unmute. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, sir. Uh -huh. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for including me. I see my friend, um, Professor Muna, and Dulu there, and a number of very distinguished people. <clears throat> um, I should point out that uh, the term traditional leader, uh, in my case, uh, has to be explained because uh, I don't want to be accused of where trying to, <laughs> to represent uh, my, myself. In, in, I start, encountered customary law as one of the pioneering students of Professor Allot uh, in London, uh, School of uh, Oriental and African Studies, when he introduced his program of LLM, African Law. And that's where I um, came across various legal systems Joanna Law, Kikuyu Law, and so forth and so on. <clears throat> and then I, um, in the course of my research work at Yale Law School, I actually wrote a paper on interest in land <laughs> in the customary law of Ghana. Uh, so 
that brought me in one aspect of uh, customary law. <clears throat> and then I went to international service and came back and became a chief. And in my capacity as a chief, I'm an administering customary law in my traditional courts. I'm also a member of the National House of Chiefs in Ghana, involved in um, a review of the customary law of Ghana uh, with a view to reforming customer law, uh, harmonizing customer law, uh, and deleting various uh, aspects which are harmful to um, society. So that is a perspective which I bring. But I would like to make one point that both in my research as a um, uh, legal scholar at Yale Law School and also as a chief administering customer law, I have seen a, a disparity between what is said to be the official customer law so far as judicial decisions are concerned and what actually exists in the community. Uh, the Ghana uh, law defines customer law as law rules of customer <laughs> law, which are actually applicable to various communities. So <clears throat> the first issue that we have to confront is ascertainment of customer law. Do we rely on judicial decisions? <clears throat> Do we lie, rely on legislation or do we rely on what is actually uh, prevailing in various communities? Now, having talked about ascertainment, the big challenge is the reform of customer law. Here, <clears throat> I have to say also that I have done some research in Kenya and South Africa and Ghana on the legal environment for small scale business and the legal impediments to African part women to part participating in this uh, system. I've also <clears throat> occasionally had given lectures to a number of people coming from all parts of Africa. And I've asked them one question, is it feasible to have legislation address uh, certain uh, issues or certain practices which are supported by deeply felt uh, customs, uh, deeply felt um, or rather strong beliefs or cultural practices and so forth and so on. And in my experience, legal reform by legislation has also had it's uh, the problems. So this is my way of introducing that customer law has challenges in terms of the ascertainment of customer law and in terms of reform. I agree with my uh, colleagues that uh, is not uh, customer law is not static. It has to change, but how do you change it? How do you involve traditional leaders in changing this? And, how do you leave the court to change customer law when, as Professor Mundura said, uh, they are bound by precedent and they look to the certainty of the law as they can find it in precedent? Or how do you, by one sweep of legislation, uh, change deeply felt customs which are not easy to change? This will be my introduction, and then we can go any further. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Nanais Kebi Asante. Uh, Honorable Chief Charumbira, now it's it's your turn, please. Sorry, Honorable, you, you need to unmute, please. We can hear you. Am I okay now? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, as has been mentioned, 
um, Chief Charumbira Meninga traditional leader uh, in Zimbabwe. Currently, as has been mentioned by yourself in your introduction, I've been, I've been a traditional leader since 1991, and I've been leading the institution of traditional leaders, which basically are what you call the king, your chiefs, your, your, your sub chiefs, your village heads. He, since uh, 2005, this is my 16th year, as mentioned. I'm coming into this as a practitioner in this discussion, not a practitioner, not as a theorist, but I have had enough of theory also. I've been subjected to a lot of research and a lot of theory, and that's all theory and the practice. Now, to start off in Zimbabwe, we have no problem with uh, the law and the traditional leaders. Before independence, after independence, the constitution was really inadequate in those areas. But as you may be aware, we undertook a review of the whole constitution, a protest move away from the 1980 constitution, which we called the colonial constitution. Then we, we said that we are now coming up with a people-driven constitution. And the people were consulted, which gave us a whole chapter. So in our constitution of chapter 15, it relates to traditional leaders and as an institution uh, with a lot of provisions, and I won't go into detail about that. And I see it as president of the National Council of Chiefs because that is a constitutional provision. Now, this has been very interesting. And I should really thank the organizers, and I look forward to more such interactions on this topic. The topic of uh, customary law in a changing Africa. And I was saying to myself, what is changing? I think that's the, even since yesterday, we all have the challenge. What has actually changed? We are assuming the change. I don't, I'm not hearing the change. The change then that they should say, and then there's a, we imply as if customary law may end. It is like maybe the times are such that customary law is going to continue. But I, we need to go deeper than that. You know, I'll take a very different dimension for this. I've been listening since yesterday. But I think we need to go beyond that. Why are we talking of changing Africa? Nobody has explained what has changed in Africa. And the why then we are confronted with the problem of customary law. I think we need to go into interrogation of those issues. You see, I think the reality about this whole customary law changing Africa, I think the reality is that after independence, Africa has been unable to us find its own space in the African country. This is who we are. That's a basic problem. We have not been able to define ourselves. The old developed, the, the developed countries are developed because they've been very clear as to who they are. We have not been able to define ourselves clearly. We, what, what values? Where I want to go? What models? We are just copying and copying and pasting here and there. Then we have all these problems about customary law. What is customary law? And the most when say African customary law, because there's no such thing as African customary law doesn't exist because it implies there are certain standards in Ghana, in Zimbabwe, we have to, we have to follow. No, no, we don't, we don't have one yardstick. And that diversity is the richness of Africa. Go to Europe. Europe has problems. Even the EU, they are saying, some countries are saying, if we become part of the EU, we're going to lose our values. So want to take out of the EU. 
So diversity, whether in the Western world or Africa, is very healthy. As, as long as it's diversity that we believe in, not imposed. So I want to emphasize the point that we seem to be imposing the issue, the issue of changing, but the change is not clear. The, it's because after independence, after independence, we have not been able to find ourselves as Africans. In every sector, whether it's culture, whether it's education, whether it is the way we do our, I'm running our economies, it's basically the same problem. Now we are talking about both customer law only. And I, because I want to be very clear on this one, that it's basically a colonial problem that we, are not, we question customs of Malawians. We question the customs of Zambians, Zimbabweans, and Ghanaians. And we know that the problem is that anything that is African is perceived inferior. So when you, you thrive on African vines, you are perceived inferior. That's the, that's the norm across the world. So do we still need these values? These customs, this question starts from the day Africa was colonized. In fact, they, during colonialism, they tried to destroy everything and they failed. And uh, yesterday, Professor Raymond at Guba, I think, crowned it all. Do we ever envisage a situation where customary law will can disappear? I don't see it. I don't think that will ever happen. It can never disappear. Go to Tanzania today. Tanzania Nyerere around 1962 abolished traditional authorities. Basically, even today, you don't have chiefs in Tanzania at the level of legislation. But when you go to rural areas in Tanzania, chiefs exist despite that lack of legislative provision for it. The chiefs exist. They still exist. They, they, they preside over traditional courts. The point I'm making is that I, I don't think it's possible whether by legislation or something and say we don't desire this thing. And one progressive idea that I, I will endorse also is rather than seek to fight and remove customary law, you will actually can you include it in all the things that you do, including the legislation? And when you do that, if there are any areas that you think are repugnant, which of course is again is a colonial thing, then you can go ahead. That. In Zimbabwe, I have a problem, for example, and there is it uh, Andulo, Professor Andulo there mentioned this correctly. It's a problem that haunt us. You know the law that we use in Zimbabwe was a result of a rebellion by the, the natives, the, the Africans, shown and the in 1896. And after that rebellion, our whites were almost defeated and we were killed. And they that kept authority, which uh, Professor Andula mentioned, who, who were under Cape Colony, even in Zimbabwe. Then the law was passed in 1987, just by pointing to the law, they said, because of the rebellion, Certain people have to be executed. And there's no such law. So with immediate effect, we are now going to apply the Roman Dutch law because it, it, it provides for, for execution. And I can go into a lot of history about it. So the law that we call the Roman Dutch today in our faculties of law in Zimbabwe, someone sitting in Cape Colony alone, because he was the commissioner, simply said, that's the law that will apply. In, in Rhodesia. And today we live under that law. And you want to say that law is superior to the law that are we ourselves, which is indigenous to ourselves. No, 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 that debate should continue. It cannot be superior in any way. So when you say have customer, that cannot be, it's not possible. But we realize that we now are in a situation where we can, we have to live with both systems. There are good aspects of the Roman Dutch law, 
they're going to ask the, the African customer law. So if that is agreed, we move on. A crisis, I just want to keep comments. As we through, through, listening to debate since yesterday, the issue of criminal law, and even from the whatever, Professor Lumumba, when he presented yesterday, he mentioned a very fundamental issue that if the, the criminal law has to be written. If it's not written, there's no criminal law. Today, the reality is that the, cash, African, the customary law, the African customary law has been destroyed in the area of criminal law. That area you find that Africa should much recognize. What is recognized most is in the civil areas. In most countries, the African customary law jurisdiction is ousted on criminal matters. African courts have no criminal jurisdiction. Why? And, and, and we, should, we should understand why. Because when you get to criminal law, the values are totally divergent. The values are totally, totally divergent. The Western, the Western will rely on prisons and courts and executions. In the African system, at least from where I come from, Southern Africa, we do not, in our customary law systems, have prisons. And we've never had prisons. And the whole, all the values are off. Honorable, honorable. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I want to ask a few more questions. I think you both okay. raised a lot of extremely interesting and challenging questions, including you raising the question of what is changing. And one of the things that is changing is that we're nowadays doing business in Zoom wherever we are. That's a big change that we're all getting used to. Right? And the world is changing, and I don't know where it's changing, but I think you raised some very important questions. What are these values? What customary role is customary law plays in it? And let me ask you both, and let me go back to you, Professor Nana SKB Asante. You mentioned- And something that is very important. Very, very right, important. Right, right, sir. Human rights. Because I want to quickly move to that. There are a lot of issues that we need to discuss. You know, women rights and culture, for example. It, you see, the gender, marriage, custody, inheritance, and empowerment, which you can discuss. I know there's a lot of friction. There is friction, I'm calling friction, in these areas between customary practices in some, some jurisdiction, not all. This is of land, access to land by women. This is gender violence, marriage. With the payment of what we call Obola. But I want to say, I think we should accept that it is not the homogeneity of values across the world that makes us richer as human beings. Some heterogeneity is a bit of differences, yes, but there are some universal values that's accepted, and those will abide by. But when you say, for example, and I want to, to trigger this debate, which I nobody started on, you are aware that through women's rights today, people are now sneaking in issues of sexual orientation and homosexuality, for example. So then people say, African law, where are you? Africa is changing. What is changing? Because there's homosexuality and sexual orientation. And you say, no, that is the change we are talking about. We will have to be very strong and, uh, and stick to our African values in African customer law. Thank you very much for now. I didn't hear you. Thank you. And you know, one thing that I will say is that the world is changing in general. And I think I totally agree with you with diversity of views that exist everywhere. There's diversity of view, as you've noticed, we recently had an election in the United States. And certainly there were very diverse views expressed in the United States and we continue to express them. But let's go back to the uh, customary law and both your role. I mean, Professor Nana Eskebiasan, you've been an academic, you've been, you've drafted the constitution, you practice in courts. To you, what, and you've highlighted some of the challenges with customary law. Let me, let me ask you a little bit about the relationship between the formal legal system and the customary legal system in Ghana. Where do you see the challenges and where do you see the opportunities? And the same question goes to you as well, uh, Honorable Sharon Beer. Let's start with Professor Nana Skebi Asante, please. Well, thank you very much. Um, I too believe that there are certain values 
in African cosmology, which have to be preserved. And I think Professor Ndulo mentioned the idea of community interest in land. I must say that when I was researching at Yale Law School, I wrote a, an article in which I traced the progressive expansion of the rights of individuals to own land and to alienate land, which was contrary to the uh, <clears throat> customary uh, doctrine propagated by the courts. <clears throat> So I became a chief and now I am very sensitive to the idea of individual uh, citizens in my area alienating large tracts of land to various people who are now trying to grab land from Africa. So I see myself invoking the communal interest in land in trying to protect, you know, the um, uh, land uh, system in my country. So I can see a situation where the perpetration of certain values in customer law can be beneficial. But there are challenges. For example, the constitution of Ghana and this is that <clears throat> spouses who are married together should have an equitable interest in property which is acquired uh, during their marriage. Now, <clears throat> this is a very important pronouncement because previously customary law had a situation where property acquired during the marriage only became the property of the husband. And there were a number of decisions of our courts which challenged this and thought that this was inequitable. The constitution has now promulgated a norm in article 22. However, <clears throat> legislation has to be passed. So one of the challenges is that even in reforming customary law, the uh, mechanism for reforming it, the legislation itself has become a problem because how do you enact? You enact legislation with a group of legislators. To what extent have they really consulted the community or done a social science study which reflects all the various aspects of the issue? So how do you reform the law. And I would, I would really um, <clears throat> rather um, descend from my colleague uh, submission that, you know, any attempt to reform law is, as it were, uh, trying to disintegrate the uh, corpus of African law. I, I think he himself acknowledged that there are problems in succession, there are problems in land ownership, there are problems in relations between um, husbands and wives. And these are matters which have been governed by customary law, but are matters which with the passage of time and with economic and other changes and with interaction with various uh, cultures and exposure to constitutional and international norms, we see that there has to be a gradual change. And uh, our women uh, are sensitive to the need for this change. And I think customer law uh, should not resist these changes. So the challenges, as I see, is this. The, the uh, traditional leaders administer law. We are with the people who see the various difficulties going on. Then the elite in parliament and so forth says that, well, these are areas where there has to be a reform. It seems to me that there has to be some understanding between 
the uh, <clears throat> legislators, the political leaders, and the traditional leaders as to the particular areas of reform. Because otherwise, an imposition of reform by statute will not work. And I have asked this question to, uh, to many groups in various parts of Africa. Has your legislation been able to change uh, various systems which are supposed to be socially harmful? Uh, and there's always a reservation. No, they passed legislation, but it didn't work. They passed legislation, for example, in Ghana, they passed legislation to change <clears throat> succession in matrilineal societies where the <clears throat> wives and the children were given a very uh, poor uh, status, as far as the society is concerned. But this was not done with proper consultation, and there is a, a complete disparity between what the law says and what the practice is in some communities. In some communities, they are still going on. Uh, sometimes I have to see, as a traditional leader, that things are uh, going on which are quite contrary to the law. And what do I do? Uh, you can say that this is not what the law has said, but the inbuilt uh, customs of the people have not been affected. So there has been a, a more sophisticated and nuanced way of legislating these changes. I agree that the changes should not be dictated by the uh, feelings or the perspectives of the urban communities without reference to what is going on in the rural areas where the bulk of our traditional people are living. So there is a cha challenge in identifying areas of reform. There's a challenge in actually executing the reforms because there has to be a proper coordination between the legislators and the traditional leaders and other social uh, uh, groups or stakeholders. These are some of the challenges uh, that I see. <clears throat> I have been actually engaged by the <clears throat> leaders of parliament to uh, prepare a bill uh, with my colleagues on how to translate some of these constitutional uh, norms into bills. And I'm saying this out of my experience in how the previous attempts to do so uh, were not successful. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nana Eskebiasante. We already see some diversity and some debate uh, of views between uh, you and your colleagues as well. Uh, Honorable Chief Charumbiru, now it's your turn. Go ahead, sir. All right, now let me take another angle of this debate. Customary law and what you may call common law, Western law, uh, one reality that we need to accept is that, first of all, what we call the other customary law in general in most countries is not as the original customer. And even as we apply it in various countries, as we preside over courts, like in our, in our constitution, for example, the customer law courts are enshrined in the constitution. But as we practice and apply customary law, it's no longer the original purity of that law. It has been modified as we have moved uh, because of certain realities about law. Then you, so that you find that in terms of ensuring justice in a customer law court, uh, that court is still governed by statute law. It's a customer law court, but governed by statute law. When someone is summoned to customer law court, you find that the whole procedure to ensure fairness, as they call it, the principles of natural justice. The whole process is required by statute. This is very important. So the application of customary law itself is prescribed by statute. Hey, like in our country. Hey, why not? Don't open that door. Sorry, I apologize. There is there was somebody that had their 
microphone on and you see change is good. I changed and I turned the microphone off. So sometimes change is positive. The microphone was on and was disturbing us. We changed and we turned it off so that we can hear Honorable Chief Charumbira. Go ahead and apologies for that. Sorry, sir, you need to change and turn your microphone on. <laughs> I'm muted, I can see. We can hear you. Is it okay now? Thank you. Yes. And apologies for I'm saying the, the whole procedure of customer law court is now prescribed by statute. The way you summon the summons, the papers, they are actually a prescribed by law. The process in the court, the hearing process is prescribed by law. Or by statute. Enforcement, the way you enforce your judgment is all prescribed. I think that is major reform of customary law. That it is not the old way of kangaroo courts where you just call somebody and say, sit there, you are guilty before you say anything. So there's this good blending between yeah, what we want to call the, the general law, statute law and uh, customer even the enforcement aspect is also governed. And I think that's great reform to, to customary law. I want to come back to the issues of uh, areas that are always contentious. And I believe this conference should then pick this as the next stages. There are aspects of customary law that are agreeable. That I don't think they are, they are not even contentious. Every human being, human being, a Muntu, Babantu, will agree to those. But we should agree that over time, the issue of rights, and I want to agree again with the Professor Mdulo, that I think there is this overstatement about customer law and human rights. Assuming that customer law has no regard for human rights, it's not correct. Because I'm just quoting my con our constitution, the constitution, fundamental human rights, right to life. Surely our customs also enshrine right to life even before colonialism. You cannot kill right to personal liberty, but there are rights to over, over, over arrested and detained persons. Fortunately, in our customary law, we don't detain people, we don't arrest people in this measure. So these are rights that really have nothing to right to human dignity. A right to personal security. I think what we have in our constitutions as fundamental rights, even our typical a uh, customary law, respect those rights. Uh, the debate is when we go beyond this is about women. It's mainly to do with gender. This is my submission. It's more to do with the gender issues. That's where you find, and I friction, as I call it, or challenges that uh, in some, and not all, in some African communities, indeed, in terms of inheritance, in terms of marriage, and even access to land. But I want to say in Southern Africa in general, and Zimbabwe in particular, in terms of our cultures, for example, you don't dispossess so, a woman because the the, 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 the widow, because the husband is passed away, and then they say, hey, all the land is taken away from you, from the widow. No, 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 no. We don't have such cultures. But I want to defend that because in some countries, you may find these things are happening. So what we need to do is to probably sit down and say, which, not in the countries, which societies are still need some reforms. I think it would be easier to point specific societies and communities in Africa, the debate will be less controversial. But when you generalize and say, yeah, women have no access to land in Southern Africa, we say, no, that's not correct. That's not correct. I think again, let me end here. Let me stop or again add one more point. The presentation by another lady, I, I can't remember the name, 
she touched on post-conflict and property rights. Post-conflict and property rights. I think this is an area of customary law that we need to sit down again and interrogate. Because when there is conflict, traditional authority, customary law authority, is the, the powers are ousted. It's very important. Whenever there's conflict, it is all about crime, crime, criminal law, not the, the usual civil cases that is customary cause handle. If these are become these become police cases, these become state cases. So the state takes over when you have conflict and uh, property rights. They, they, they basically ignored customs. Yet at the end of the day, the customer law can help. There was mention of if people come back, do they reclaim their rights, their properties? Yes, in a typical, well-organized uh, customer law setting, in a properly set up uh, culture, you find that your land, like in Zimbabwe, the land belongs to, if it's rural land, belongs to your family in perpetuity. It's very important. So whether you went away because of war and you came back after 15 years, we'll still say this land belonged to the Gazingalizi family. It is theirs. It's not a year that, no, there that you went away for 15 years because of the war. No, you land, you back, it's yours. It belongs to your family in perpetuity. We succeed, my father, and then my sons, my grandies, until the end. So there will be no problem. But because it becomes the issue of the state, they criminalize, they do whatever, resolving it now in a civil manner becomes very problematic. But if you went back to the chief and he said, before the war, this was my land, the chief would say, yes, this is your land. Thank you very much. Let me end, stop here. Thank you. Um, one thing that I've already heard from many and that we're going to change, and this is the change we're going to make, you must both agree to come back and we're going to have at least a one hour session with each of you so that you can share more fully your ideas. In the time of Zoom, one of the challenges that we had in organizing the conference was to figure out how long could people pay and stay engaged on Zoom but uh, hopefully you will both agree to come back because I feel we all wanna hear much more from you. I think it's been enlightening, but what I wanna do at least with the permission of uh, my real boss, Gertrude, that is looking over me to say the next panelist to start, I will take license to at least give both Professor Nana, SKB Asante and um, Honorable Chief Charumbira the final thoughts with the promise that you will come back and that we will give you much more time to express your views and share your thoughts with us. I think there's a lot that we can all learn from you, not just in Africa, but frankly around the world. And I hope that in future we can engage you much longer. Go ahead, Professor Nana Skebiasande, your final thoughts and then Honorable Chief Charumbir, please. Well, thank you very much. Um... There's one thing that I have not actually touched upon. I think my, my brother, uh, the Honorable Fortune, Cherumbira mentioned that. Um, <clears throat> and that is the marginalization of traditional leaders in policy making. We have a situation where of course, traditional leaders were displaced by our new political elite. There are various areas where they play a very little role. Um, we are excluded from parliament, for, for example, in Ghana. And there's really no way of having our voice heard in parliament and even in local government, there is no direct access of chiefs. There's no direct representation of chiefs. The chief may be um, appointed as a government nominee, 
which is uh, an indirect way. Uh, <clears throat> we all know how this started, you know, I mean, the, certainly in Ghana and West Africa, there was indirect rule and therefore the nationalists saw us as allies of the colonial authorities because we were participated in the old uh, system and therefore nationalism meant ousting the chiefs. But you have a situation where we have a very elaborate system of traditional organization, which can be very useful, particularly in these days of COVID-19, in sensitizing people, in helping people to protect themselves and so forth. And we just cannot ignore this traditional system in our governance system, in my view. There has been some collaboration. There's a, the um, um, degradation of the environment uh, because licenses are given without the participation of chiefs. There are so many areas where traditional authorities being close to the rural communities could play a major role, but this is not being done. And I think it's an asset which is not utilized. I will make that point to reinforce the role that we could play in the forming the customer law because customer law cannot really be reformed without the involvement of the um, <clears throat> traditional leaders. And we are sensitive to where the customer laws should be reformed. I agree with my, my brother that we should examine the communities where certain practices need reform. I entirely agree because you can't generalize throughout uh, Africa, I have seen that myself, but there are certain areas, as Professor Muna said, every institution is subject to change. Every institution, even the common law, is subject to change. There are so many rules of common law which have been changed over the years with, with the passage of time and with new uh, social ideas. So we, we need everybody on board and uh, nobody should be marginalized in this great exercise that we are engaged upon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Naneske Biasante. Um, Honorable Chief Charumbira, your final words for us. I think the, first of all, thank you. And also say we need to develop this discussion, very fruitful. And simply say also that um, the, the debate in the future should not be to jet to move out to one aspect of the law. I think history has placed us in such a situation that uh, we will have to leave ourselves with Roman Dutch law. We are not Roman, we are not Dutch, but it's a reality, we'll have to live with that. But also, that there will be no such term that uh, we can say anything that is African indigenous or customary can be totally excluded from ourselves. And I want to say this using the point that research in Zimbabwe and in our own communities, a Professor Nana Santi, we have experiences where when I refer a matter, a magistrate court or the high court. People in my area will say, why? Or in another area, they are abandoning us. We, we, we want the system, the customer system that say, no, maybe my jurisdiction on that issue. I don't have jurisdiction on this matter. And uh, we have cases where we where when there's maximum monetary jurisdiction, like a, a chief or whatever level traditional leader cannot impose a fine more than 1,000 US. The person comes once 2,000, they say, no, 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 no. 2,000, the high court say, I'm going to reduce it to below 1,000 so that my case is handled by your, your courts, not those other courts. And these are people who love our courts. In a particular year, traditional courts in my own country, we have to do more than double the number of cases that are handled by 
magistrates, high courts, supreme courts, and that is very healthy. So we cannot do away with customer law court. But let's sit down and and the way this reform and and look at those areas. There is practices where they are taking place. Let's send the traditional leaders. Let's help the professors, teams that can help on the ground so that people can come on board and say, in certain, in terms of certain practices. Otherwise, the two, in our case, customer law and Roman Dutch law, they have been blended, permanently blended together and cannot be separated. We just have to see how we maneuver within that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have come to the conclusion of this panel discussion, but obviously it seems to me that really we just started the conversation with both Honorable Chief Charumbira and Professor Nanes Kebea Sante. I have written down at least 10 topics that we will get back to you on to start customary law conversations. And of course, the first thing that we will discuss is the title of whatever lecture series we're planning to do. Let me reassure you on this. We had a conference in Botswana in 2009 with many of the same participants. We are having a conference in 2020. I am sure that I hope to be alive in another 20 years, and I am pretty comfortable that there will be a customer law conference in 2040 and in 2050. Because I see that customer law is here to stay as much as all the other legal systems are here to stay. But you know, let me just close on the word change. The word change has got a lot of attention today. But when you think about it, the word change is not a bad word. When we wake up, we change. Our bodies change. Our ideas change. So there is good and bad change. And African customary law, in my opinion, has to embrace its own change. And the question is, where is this change going to be? Change could be positive. Professor Nanes Kebe Asante just said, traditional leaders have been marginalized. And in my view, traditional leaders are a huge untapped resource. In many parts of the continent, the only authority is the traditional leader that is left alone to deal with a myriad of problems all on his own. And I can imagine the request that you get. Change can also be bad. And Honorable Chief Charumbir mentioned the Tanzanian experience that tried to wipe out a system that people really want to continue. So thank you both very much. I apologize for the little time we've given you, but we promise you to bring you back so that we can hear from you. Thank you so much. Back to you. Thank Gary. you so much. Thank you very much, um, Professor Galiti. That's an excellent job done in leading uh, this very important discussion with our distinguished uh, traditional leaders. Clearly, like you have said, there's a need to interrogate these issues a lot more. And uh, we can assure you that the UPS Law School and the Leitner Center will definitely get back to you with, with much more of such platforms. So once again, thank you so much, Nana Professor SKB Asante. And of course, thank you so much, Honorable Chief Fortune Charumbira. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to move on to the next panel or the next session of this conference. And this is a panel on natural resources management, innovation, and African customary law. To lead us in the discussion, as our moderator for this panel, we have Mr. Victor Broby. Now, Mr. Victor Broby is a lecturer at the Faculty of Law at the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration here in Ghana. So I wouldn't want to take too much of our time. I would want to move on and hand over straight away to Mr. Victor Brobe. Mr. Brobe, can you hear me, please? I believe I can. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Over to you. All right, thank you very much, uh, uh, Gertrude. Um, so thanks for so thanks for to all of you for participating in this really sort of um, vital and important set of discussions. I mean, this, this has been um, a quite riveting um, few days, and um, the the next panel, I believe, is going to be um, equally riveting because we are about to tackle. 
the, the very vexed problem of, uh, of natural resource governance and traditional leaders. Um, now, this is an issue that we struggle with um, throughout the, the continent. Um, what precisely should our natural should our traditional leaders have? What role should they have when it comes to um, natural resource governance? Now, different African countries have um, different levels of involvement um, in this area. No country really has found that sort of the magic bullet or the happy medium um, that um, can really allows um, the um, the country to come up with a perfect system to uh, to manage these um, to manage all these resources. Um, so we we have assembled, or the um, the, the sense has assembled a, a very distinguished panel to um, examine these um, these issues, um, consisting of Professor um, Jan Ubink um, from the University of Leiden, um, and, and Dr. Bolanti Arinoso. Um, George Fordham and Bernadette Ajay. Um, I think the way in which we'll proceed, given that we only have 55 minutes, is to have each speaker um, present um, in the order that is provided for in the, in the program. And so I think the, um, I, I think what I'll do is hand over to our first speaker in the person of um, Professor Janine Ubink. She's a professor of governance and law at the, at the Van Wellenbaum Institute of National Law at Atlanta University. Her research centers around Africa, governance and law with a primary focus on customary law and is related to state law and traditional authorities. Um, she is also uh, the president of the National Commission on International Legal Pluralism and works as a consultant in the field in, in various African countries. I've been familiar with Professor Ubing's work for a very, very, very long time, at least um, 15, 20 years. I think she's done some really sort of seminal groundbreaking work on the, the traditional um, rules and laws in my part of the world, which is Periyaba and Kumasi. And so without any further ado, uh, if I can invite Professor Ubing to um, uh, give her a presentation um, over the course of the next 10 minutes, um, Professor. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, let me start by sharing my screen and bringing up my yes. I think that works like this. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, we are. Okay, we are. very good. Uh, it's not at the first slide, so let me go up for a sec. Uh, I don't know why that is. Okay. Um, okay, so what I'd like to talk to you about today um, and I'm, I'm slightly hesitant after uh, the nice presentations we've just had, uh, because this is uh, a field I'm going to be talking about where um, chiefs are not doing a particularly good job and where, where there's a lot of unrest around what's happening. Um, so I want to be talking to you about South Africa, where there's currently a big fight about um, the role traditional leaders should play in contemporary South Africa. And that fight is connected to different underlying conceptions of customary law. So to tell you a little bit about those underlying conceptions, um, on the one hand, we have the constitutional court. Uh, we already had uh, Chuma Humonga's uh, presentation yesterday on, on, on living customary law. Well, in that living customary law jurisprudence, we see that the court sees customary law as something that comes from practice and as practice as something coming from the people, right? So it's not imposed from the top, it depends on acceptance of the people as also becomes clear in those two quotes here on my slide. Now, this is quite strongly in contrast with the conception that the legislator seems, seems to take. Um, because if we look at the um, lawmakers agenda of about the last two decades, then we see that they've been drafting several laws that would give traditional leaders um, highly centralized powers to, to make law, to make customary law, uh, and also to take decisions on community man matters, particularly uh, controversial, is regarding natural resource management. And, and the justification of putting that in that legislation is that these powers 
uh, would already be in customary law, right? They would be derived from customary law. And you see a number of uh, acts and bills here on the slide that they have been uh, drafting and enacting. Now, these, these laws and, and bills have been severely critiqued by rural communities and activists, uh, particularly because these bills and acts, they do very clearly say the powers that chiefs will have under these laws but they don't talk about accountability of the chiefs. They don't talk about checks and balances. Um, they don't talk about decision-making at other levels than the senior, the highest level of traditional leadership. Um, so they're critiqued also for, for, for compromising the rights, uh, the citizenship rights and democratic rights of people living in those former uh, homelands. Um, and it's not just uh, local communities and activists, uh, this is also a critique that is shared actually by two panels from the government, and I'll, I'll show you this quote as one, which is from the high level panel uh, led by former President Motlante, which criticizes these laws for their failure to dismantle the apartheid and homeland boundaries that enclose people in constructed and imposed units of identity. Uh, and a little bit further on, it says, as a result of the type of laws that are coming out now, people's rights to exercise customary affiliation and to demand accountability for their leaders are neutralized. So very strong critique uh, from this panel and from another panel uh, established by the president. So we see these opposing sort of conceptions of customary law, right, with the constitutional court rooting the content of customary law in people's actual practices. Uh, and in their consent, while the legislators' agenda is very much focused on, on centralizing the power of the highest level of the senior traditional leaders, including their powers to define customary law. And we see that communities aren't agitating against customary law, they aren't agitating per se against traditional leadership, but they are saying this conception brings us back to the apartheid period, brings us back to a, an autocratic conception of customary law that we don't recognize and that we have seen will be very detrimental to our rights. So I've been studying this together with the uh, London Accountability Research Center at the uh, University of Cape Town, and particularly with Joanna Pickering on mining issues and with Tiane Duda on leadership disputes and democracy. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about that first research on mining with, uh, with Joanna. Um, so mining in South Africa is mostly done on customary land. Um, and for this land, if, if a mine, uh, mining company wants to mine somewhere officially, they need a surface lease that is concluded between the ministry and the mining company. But what happens in effect is that the ministry sends these companies to the chief to make a deal. Now we've been studying this, uh, particularly uh, the platinum uh, mining belt in uh, Northwestern Limpopo and our own field work was in, in Limpopo around this mine that I'm showing you, the Mogalakwena mine. Um, and these areas witness uh, huge deals between chiefs uh, on behalf of their communities is what they say and uh, mining companies. Now, interestingly enough, these deals um, of course, they're, they're, they're a combination of customary law and state law. This is a very interesting example of legal pluralism, because on the one hand, the chiefs, of course, say that they have these rights uh, to conclude these deals because they are the custodians of, of, of the customary land, right? So on the basis of customary law. But at the same time, of course, the deals that come into being between the mining company and the community has nothing to do with customary law, right? They're all about uh, company law and shares and investment companies and swap deals and, and tax constructions. Now, you can imagine that the consequence of that is that the customary accountability structures, right, the elders uh, being uh, represented in the chief's council, uh, the general meetings that they have, that for a lot of people, this is just way above their head. It's really, really complicated legal, financial, etc. Uh, stuff. In addition to that, what they find is that when people, there's, there's a lot of anxiety about these deals because of course people lose their farmland, they get a lot of pollution, blasting, um, and in addition the revenue, which is huge, that comes out of it very often only to a very minimal extent reaches the community. Uh, a lot of that uh, ends up with um, either the chief or the royal family or the traditional council. So a lot of communities try to oppose these deals and um, they try to do that in those customary settings, 
but they're often just pushed aside, not listened to. Um, if, if elders are being critical, they're, they're put on, on, on non-active, basically. So what they then do, and that's where the interesting legal pluralism again comes up, is that they try to organize a community meeting outside of those customary forums. But then what happened in many cases is that the chiefs take those cases to the state court and try to get an interdict at the state court for organizing community meetings outside of the customary fora by someone who is not the chief. And they have been granted many of those interdicts. And one of these cases had to go all the way up to the constitutional court for the constitutional court to say, this is not possible. These people have the right to assembly, of course. But still, even after that constitutional court decision, we find that such interdicts are sought by chiefs and are granted, particularly by high courts in Northwest province. In addition, when community activists or community members who are opposing these deals themselves try to go to a state court, we get the same argument. Chiefs are arguing that these people don't have local standing to talk about land matters from the community. And often again, these claims are accepted. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Because you can imagine that these new laws, which, as I said, state the rights of the chief without stating the rights of the community, without saying, stating the, uh, the, the obligations of the chief and his accountability, that these will make these kind of issues worse. And I'll give you a very uh, short example of that. So there is a good legal argument to actually be saying that all of these deals contravene the law because of this law, IPILRA, the Interim Protection of Informal Land Rights Act of 1996, which gives effect to two constitutional sections that say that we need to protect those whose tenure is legally insecure because of past racially discriminatory laws and practices. So IPILRA says there's no person or community can be deprived of any informal right to land without their consent, except in the case of expropriation. Now, the question is, do therefore these mining deals contravene IPILRA because the people haven't given consent? Or as the mining companies have been saying and the government has been saying, does the mining act, the NPRDA in particular, trump IPILRA, right? That's a later act. So would that mean that IPILRA doesn't count for that? Now there's a very interesting new judgment uh, from a year and a half old, I think the Maledo judgment, which says, no, the NPRDA, the mining act must be read concurrently with the PILRA, meaning those directly affected must be consulted and consent to any deprivation of their informal land rights. And beware, those directly affected is not the same as getting the permission of the chief, right? It's actually those directly affected. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because what was the response of the Department of Traditional Affairs, so the, the government, they amended one of those earlier bills and laws that I showed you to try and prevent this from happening. Whether they've succeeded, that most likely not. But I'm telling you that because it shows you with the intention of the government. Their intention really is to make mining easier. And this has a lot to do also with the economic incentives in there from which also government and um, um, uh, businessmen, and that's quite a revolving door at the moment, a, a, a small proportion of a new black elite uh, after uh, 1994. So let me conclude, because I think I only had 10 minutes, probably used them already, that I'm hoping that this shows for you that these new laws, uh, which have a sort of an authoritarian understanding of customary law, right? Something, customary law is something to be, to be defined and imposed on rural communities by senior traditional leaders and, and their royal families. Um, that they, those types of laws will play an important role in these struggles between chiefs and their communities. And the worry of rural communities of activists is that they will re-tribalize the countryside very much again in the style of apartheid South Africa, and that they will minimize rural democracy um, and that they will really impede the enjoyment of the same effective political and, and property rights uh, as the rest of South Africa, just because people are living in these former homelands. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, it, it was like more than 10 minutes, but you gave us a lot to um, to think about and, and unpack over there. Um, I, I think the way in which we um, we may proceed is that I can um, um, perhaps take a, a few um, a few questions at this point while the um, 
uh, the points are still fresh and um, and open the, the, the discussion to the panel. But uh, my, my, my first um, question to you, um, for Fubing, is what is what moderation and influence can civil society play in um, in this scenario? Because um, in some of the jurisdictions that I've been familiar with, the um, the utter helplessness of the traditional societies has been somewhat moderated and on occasion improved by having a, an active and well organized uh, sort of civil society um, advocacy system. Um, sort of encouraging the right behavior. To what extent is that a possibility in South Africa? I think it is, and I think that is partly happening. Um, particularly, I think there is, um, civil society is making sure that these laws don't get passed easily. So several of them are in their third reiteration because they get too much um, um, uh, uh, pushback. And part of in, in that in that pushback, civil society is very important. So there's a, a number of NGOs really helping rural communities to let their voices be heard. Because one of the for one of these laws, Clara, the Communal Land Reform Act, was in the end declared unconstitutional because there had not been enough consultation. Right. So the consultation uh, you, you see very clearly if you look at one of those other bills, uh, the traditional court bill. You see again that the um, there, there is the first version, which is made by the Law Reform Commission based on very uh, countrywide consultations with different groups. Basically, the government then pushes that off the table and comes with a new one for which they've only consulted the traditional leaders. So again, it gives you a clear indication of who the government is dealing with. I was very interested to just hear uh, Professor uh, uh, Nana uh, Asanti say, we're being marginalized. We have no way of having our words heard directly by government. That really is very, very different case in South Africa. Uh, and unfortunately, it doesn't work out well because it leads to sort of corruption between the, the business elite, uh, government elite, together with these chiefs who all profit very heavily from these mining deals where a lot of money is to be made. Uh, thanks. Um, I think it will be there'll be space for one more question um, before we move on to the the next panel uh, member. So um, let's see if there's a uh, uh, if there's a question in the chat. I will take that question. If there isn't, I, I um, would move on to um, the yes. Oh, yes, sure. I, I, uh, I'll, please go ahead, um, uh, Dr. Fortune. I, I believe your hand is up. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll mute you. Yes, my hand was up. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I go ahead? Yes, please. Professor Janine, thank you for your hard hitting facts about chiefs, traditional leaders in South Africa. I think the fundamental point is that unless natural resource development is based and recognizes the traditional and local governance systems on the ground, there will be a never-ending war in terms of management of natural resources. Inherently, people, communities and their chiefs believe that those natural resources belong to them, although they don't have the capital to exploit. So whatever model is used, it should recognize the ownership and the right of the local communities to those resources. Now, you give us a case where the chiefs sell, whether they sell land, they sell their mining rights. You know the simplest explanation of that. A typical chief, a typical traditional leader is rooted in his people or in her people. You are only a chief your own legitimacy 
for you to be a chief is because you are rooted within you. You don't steal from your people. You don't steal from them. You don't shortchange them. You don't enrich yourself against them. But why is it what you've said if could be true? I don't know whether it is true. It is because of the apartheid system we should accept these things. Uh, it's because of uh, where we've come from. Uh, Dr. The Fortune. was deprived. Dr. Fortune, uh, respectfully, if we could um, narrow the question to a um, so so that we can allow for the other panel members to uh, have an opportunity to respond. So, if, if you have any quick, if you have any quick, I'm, I'm sorry, my my camera is um, misbehaving, so I'm, I'm in and out. But if you have any um, a, a quick response, uh, uh, Professor Ubank, if not, we'll we'll go to the next speaker. No, my quick one to say I support it because of the. Historical where well, the chiefs themselves were so deprived, now they are so depriving their own people. So we need to change the whole attitude and the way things are done. Because the chief should not still for should change right. their own people. All right, thank you. Thank you, Fortune. Thank you, Fortune. So, Prof, a quick response before you go to the next. Yes, um, just a quick response. Let me just say that I I, I support what, what uh, the honorable chief is saying that this has a lot to do, of course, with the distortions wrought on the system in the apartheid, where, um, you know, the, the ones who wanted to stand up for their people were moved out of these positions, others were put in, uh, they, they got almost despotic powers over their community, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the real question is, where do we go from there, right? Because we can't easily just go back to the old system where everything was fine, also because these are not the same people. So I think uh, the Honorable Chief is actually pointing to, to a very interesting point, which makes it so challenging uh, to, to think about the contemporary position of Chief. Thank, thanks, Prof. Uh, so I'll, I'll, we'll go quickly to our next uh, uh, speaker in the person of um, Dr. Bolanu Erinosho. She's a lecturer at the Faculty of Law, University of Cape Coast, uh, was qualified as a barrister in, in Nigeria. Her LM is in International Environmental Law from Nottingham, and her doctorate is in Environmental Law from, from Sheffield. Um, she teaches and researches in the area of, as you'd expect, international environmental law. And um, she will be um, addressing us, um, broadly speaking, um, in the area of um, natural resource governance and, um, and environmental law as well, specifically on the topic of transforming ocean governance in Ghana and the role of um, customary law in ocean-facing communities. So, um, so, so Doc, um, uh, 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 the, the floor is yours, so to speak. Thank you. Uh, I'll just share my screen quite quickly and then we can start. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Hello everyone, my name is Bolanario Show, and the topic of my presentation today is on transforming ocean governance in Ghana, the role of ocean facing communities. Um, this discussion is part of an ongoing research project called the One Ocean Hub which has been generously funded by the UK government through its Global Challenges Research Fund on the, the UK Research and Innovation um, Fund. And I would like to express my thanks to the funders as well as the organizers of this conference. And so this presentation is actually a short highlight of a number of the strands of research which we are currently exploring in that area. Now, of course, the oceans are perhaps our most important natural resource. Uh, they provide multiple ecosystem services. And indeed, historically, the oceans have always been viewed from an international lens, um, which is quite um, expected. I mean, by its very nature and its global, and the fact that it spreads across all of the continents, it's quite expected that um, often when you think about the oceans, you think about uh, an international dimension. Um, indeed, uh, in the 17th century, uh, Hugo Grotius, in his seminal work on, apologies, I was just um, trying to change the slides. Ah, yes, that's better, isn't it? Right, so um, Hugo Grotius, in his um, seminal work on 
uh, Freedom of the Seas, which he called Maliberium, um, quite clearly talked about the idea that the sea, in this case, seas and oceans were open for all, and all parties should be able to utilize the resources of the ocean. Now, this concept subsequently underpinned much of the maritime exploration, which we had in the 19th century, and Britain in particular was quite an important champion of this idea. And indeed, that also underpinned the colonial experience, which many African countries um, were subjected to. And so by the early 20th century, the oceans had become not only a tool for navigation, but also had included other non-navigational uses. And that meant that unfortunately, as the uses of the ocean expanded by the 21st century, we had reached a point where the ocean as a whole was at risk and the health of the ocean is in severe decline. And of course, these challenges are multiple and the range from things like overexploitation to pollution and climate change. And these challenges are particularly exacerbated in a country like Ghana because 25% of the population indeed live along the coast. And many of those communities are actually quite poor. And so when we talk about the ocean, it's actually a very important discussion in a country like Ghana. Now, the perception of the oceans as an international resource also impacts on how ocean law is conceived in Ghana. And so much of oceans law in Ghana is actually based on international obligations adopted in treaties, some of which have been transformed into acts of parliament in line with the constitution. It also includes laws adopted by metropolitan um, assemblies and district assemblies, etc. And so that chart sort of gives you, um, it's not particularly hierarchical, but an overview of the kinds of laws that we have around the oceans in Ghana. Now, the challenge we have is that at the moment, the legal framework for the protection of the ocean and coast is actually a very centralized model. It's based on a top-down approach. So laws are made at the national level and then diffused to all the other um, levels of community. Now, the, that also means that often the laws are fragmented and quite sectoral. And by that, we mean that different government bodies are responsible for different challenges with regards to the ocean. So we've got shipping, which is different from those who manage fisheries and those who manage fisheries are, of course, different from um, a whole host of pollution, for example. And so it's quite fragmented in that context. Now, the bigger thing for us, uh, for our purposes here really is that because of the top down nature of the laws, the voices of the communities most directly impacted by legislation are often quite ignored or the emphasized in the broader scheme of things. And so decision making is often um, quite um, focused on the top at the expense of those communities. And that in turn also has significant challenges for implementation and enforcement of existing laws, which in turn also creates problems of conflict. So, particularly between um, local community fishermen and um, fishing trawlers. So for example, because the communities would often feel like the trawlers, the bigger trawlers are not being adequately um, monitored, they in turn feel that perhaps they shouldn't um, um, comply with some of the existing laws. Now, I chose the slide because it particularly highlights the big, some of the big strands of our research and some of the things we're trying to look at. Now, the images on the one side of the slide are actually taken from the news. Uh, they are from protests which were, which happened in 2018 uh, when the government declared, well, declared its intention to have a closed season for fisheries in Ghana. And so communities were not very pleased with that and they did have a protest. Now, the, the closed season was postponed to 2019 and we had one which was um, a bit limited because we could not have it the way the scientists expected the closed season to operate. 
Um, we couldn't have one in 2020 as well because of the pandemic. So we've only had one closed season. Now, on the other hand, in the same Ghana, we have to uh, appreciate that records show, for example, that Methodist coastal communities actually have a close relationship with the sea. And their relationship is not just one which is conceives this as an economic resource, as the government would often do, but one which is also cultural and religious and has value in all those dimensions. And so for places like South and Ghana, for example, parts of communities they consider to see a separate space, and some even consider it a deity. And I particularly want to highlight this case of Akufia and Mensa because it's actually an important uh, it's an interesting case. Now, in that case, uh, the prefects really are in about 1896-97, the new nets were introduced into fishing in Ghana. And those nets, which are called Ali nets, uh, now the scientific term is they're called drift nets, and they would actually be banned if they were being used today. Now, when these nets were introduced, um, it had the capacity to catch a lot more fish than the regular nets that the communities were using. And so uh, the chief of Winneba, the chief in charge of fishermen in Winneba, Winneba is not too far from where I am actually at the moment, he made the decision in conjunction after consultation with fishermen in his community to ban the use of those nets. Those fishermen who were using the nets, who were aggrieved, went to the English courts. And the judge in the case, Chief Justice Griffith, actually said that, well, the nets were actually the same as were being used on the English coast, and he could not see any um, impacts of a detrimental kind to the future of fishing if those nets were used. And the impact of that case really is on two points, because the first thing is the decision ex ignored existing maritime tenure regimes. What I mean by that is it, the court decision took away the power of the chief to make decisions as to the conservation of fisheries in his community. That power had hitherto lay with the chief. And of course, the decision also reinforced at that time European perceptions of what the sea was as an unlimited resource, which like I said, goes back to the idea of freedom of the seas, uh, it's all open for all, and which was actually, so the point is this particular situation shows us the, you know, the possibilities that customary law can bring to ocean governance. Now, what is our point? What exactly is our argument here? Our argument is quite simple. If we accept that customary law is the rule of law, which by custom are applicable to particular communities in Ghana, and if customary law emerges from what people do, or from what people believe they ought to do rather than from what a class of legal specialists consider they should do or believe, then perhaps would OCEAN's law, its implementation and enforcement not be better achieved by encouraging the use of customary laws, which are clearer, better known and more acceptable to them than a remote and mysterious state law. And that's what we're seeking to do in the project as we go ahead. And so what the hub is looking to do is to document some of the customary laws in select communities in Ghana uh, across a number of ethnic groups. So we've got the Fantes, the Gaz, and Zemas, and Dambes. And we're exploring the connections between community law, customs, value, and existing national law, for example. Um, uh, on the point about the closed season, in the same communities where we've got closed season, where, where the closed season were disputed, they actually already have in existence rest days, which are both spiritual and um, have impacts on conservation, and they do honor those rest days. And we also would explore how customary law can improve enforcement challenges. And the bigger question is interrogate participatory and inclusive ocean governance approaches in Ghana. Now, Hopefully I'm within my 10 minutes. Now, the, we realize that this approach is not without its challenges. The last few, last few sessions, I and mean, indeed yesterday and today, have highlighted some of those challenges, the idea of ascertainment of customary law, uh, the discussions that have come from that colonial history, um, which mean that we cannot say that customary law is 
pristine and so in which case what who decides what kind of customary law is relevant to conservation because ultimately if the aim is a healthy ocean we need customary law which um champions that which aids that and not detracts from it and of course there are constitutional provisions on human rights etc which would have to ensure that whatever integration is done uh, meets up with and their political and power dynamics prof Ubing has actually quite alluded to that um, with some of the chiefs the question is are they truly the representatives of the people they seek to represent and so there are all of those dynamics to uh, contend with but nevertheless we think that as shown from other countries there is actually value in exploring customary laws in the areas of for the ocean communities of ghana and i hope i kept it within time uh, almost but not quite <laughs> <laughs> thank you but thanks anyway that was um the, the truly exciting i think that was that's going to generate a a, a a lot of questions to the end i think the way we should proceed is that we should um here the last two presentations and then um, just have a, a 27 period meeting uh, period at the end in which we can respond to the question. So our, our next speaker is uh, Dr. George Wara, let me, uh, it's, um, it's George uh, Ford Otiono uh, Wara who is a, a doctoral candidate at the University of Pretoria. Um, and he is going to address us on the, um, on, on the interface between the states and um, customary legal systems in the Kenya Rift Valley. Um, so um, Dr. Barak, uh, the, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brobe, uh, for the introduction. Uh, judges, callers, uh, distinguished uh, guests, panelists, friends, colleagues, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are. <laughs> uh, my name is Ford Amwara, and I just wanted to um, clarify that even though uh, my name is Fordham and the, the organizers of this uh, conference, uh, Fordham Law School, there's no relationship between us. But uh, we, are, uh, we do interact in wonderful conferences such as this, for which I am really grateful. And uh, this, this afternoon or this morning, I am going to talk about another type of interaction. And this is the interaction, or what I would say, the interface between the uh, community's customary land tenure systems in the Rift Valley region of Kenya and the state statutory system. I, I look at this, uh, this, this um, uh, topic from the angle of systems theory, as espoused by, for example, Professor Luman in his later writings. And I, I come to the, uh, to the conclusion or to the argument that transformative law reform is, is, a, is a way that we can use or is a tool that can be used to create a, a legal framework uh, of mutual respect, mutual dignity, mutual integrity between different systems. And so I have four broad topics that I'm going to talk about today. First of all, I am going to talk about communities as systems. So I will use uh, systems theory to model these communities and to bring out the characteristics of the communities that help me arrive at the conclusion that transformative law re reform is indeed possible. I will then look at the interface of dominance that the state has used over the years to essentially disrupt these community systems and destabilize them, I, in, in effect, interfere with their integrity. And then I will look at models uh, in, my, in my third segment. I will look at the models, uh, models that the state is trying to use to reform this interface of dominance, to address the instability and, and uh, lack of equilibrium that has resulted. And then at the end, we will come back to the top topic of transformative law reform and, and see how, uh, how it can work out. So first of all, let us look at communities as systems. And what's a system? A system uh, basically is a body or a grouping of interactive and interdependent elements that are functionally different or structured to self-produce and self-preserve. 
So if we look at a community system, for example, like a community system in the Rift Valley region of Kenya, and I had four communities that I studied for this uh, uh, paper. I looked at the Maasai, the Kikuyu, the Nandi, and the Kipsigis. These systems are not just groupings of individuals. They are the individuals, their laws, their customs, their, their, the waters around them, the, the totality of the environment around them that make them a system. And in this entire environment, there are component parts that they consider essential to their survival and to their continued sustenance in this environment. And, and these component parts uh, together are what makes the community a system. So in systems theory, these different component parts, and one of the essential component parts that, uh, that, that we'll talk about here is land. These component parts work together to secure the survival of this system, to secure its continuity beyond even the individuals that make it up. So if we look at the Maasai, the Maasai want to continue surviving as the Maasai, and they want to continue surviving as such through eternity. And it's the same for the Kikuyu and for, for the Nandi and for the Kipsigis. And, and, and so when we look at the system, we look at it as a whole. Now, I do acknowledge some limitations in, in, this, in this paper or in this discussion. And some of these limitations came out in yesterday's panel. Uh, one of the limitations is language. These are the type of limitations that, that I think can create some, uh, some discussion around what is the identity of this system. So it is difficult for even this group uh, that, uh, that is discussing to arrive at consensus, at a consensus on, on the identity of a system because of such limitations like language. And we saw this even with colonialism because some of the so-called communities are, are actually groupings that were being described by the colonial regimes, or let's say the Europeans, because they were trying to make sense of the social grouping. So there are language limitations. We are using English here, for example, to describe the Maasai when the primary language of the Maasai is not English. So uh, right away, there is a limitation right there. And then there's also context limitations. Like I said, some of the, some of the terminology that was used was invented by the colonial regime so that they could make sense of the social grouping. And so it was in a certain context. So for example, a Maasai is described as such because there are non Maasais in the environment. And so there's this, this idea of, uh, of context that we, we, we should be able to capture in making a, a definition of a system. But besides these kinds of limitations, contextual limitations or language limitations, we can still have a discussion about the system because we do have, we do have characteristics that are observable and that can be isolated and used to describe this system and to understand it for the purposes of knowing why they exist in, within the environment and how they exist to secure their survival. And so I, uh, I rely on Professor Galati's uh, definition of of this, these types of markers or labels as pegs upon which we hang the community's description or the system's description so that we can have a discussion. It's essentially a pragmatic way of carrying out a discussion. But I come to the conclusion at the end of that discussion on limitation that the, the system itself, the community itself should be front and center in, de in defining itself and describing itself or identifying itself. And the rest of us who are observing or theorizing about it should be able to follow from that definition that the community itself uh, uses. But in these kinds of definitions by communities themselves, there are customary practices that also suffer from the same linguistic or contextual limitations, but there are customary practices that we cannot uh, dispute that do exist and that these communities have used over the years. So for example, in the Rift Valley region, there is communal land tenure that, uh, that we've, we've had discussed yesterday and even today. There, there is pastoralism that the Maasai, for example, used in moving around with their livestock in search of water. And there is, uh, for crop farming, there are shifting cultivation that was used. So there are community practices that were used. And these practices, if we look at uh, uh, the legal pluralism definition of, of law, for example, when such practices are used over time, and, and followed out of a sense of legal obligation by a critical mass of the community, then these practices can accurately be described as customary laws. And I think there are several examples that, uh, that can be brought out in studies that exist on the African continent and that we can say are customary laws. Even though I do agree that there's some discussion around identity, there's some discussion around context, there's some discussion about around language, but these customary laws do exist 
as surely as the communities themselves do exist. So let's now turn to examine um, the disruption that occurred. And what was the cause of this disruption? Well, I have a picture here of the Rift Valley region of Kenya. The, that's the, the, the part in red. And uh, in the next slide, you can see in the middle there, there's a, there's, there's a green, uh, sometimes men are colorblind, but there's a green patch there. And that, that, uh, that shows a picture of a forested area. It's a highland area and it's highly forested. And from that area, there's a lot of rivers flowing in different directions. In fact, some of them flow all the way to the Lake Victoria that you can see uh, on, on the Western side of Kenya. Well, what this means basically is that there was a lot of abundant water and abundant and fertile land that, uh, that was found in this region of, of, of Kenya. Really? And, and there was, there was interest, there was interest, first of all, by the communities that inhabited the area to use this land for agriculture, for food production. And as well, when the Europeans arrived in Kenya, they decided to build a railway from the coast uh, in the east, all the way to the shores of Lake Victoria in the west. And one of the things they found was that there was abundant fertile agricultural land. And they essentially wanted to take this land and integrate this land resource into their own European economy. And that's where the interface of dominance came in. Basically, the Europeans decided to uh, interact with the African customary systems through a framework of domination so that they could expropriate this land and use it for their own um, capitalistic gains. And so what happened, the Europeans created what we call the white islands or scheduled areas. And I would, I'll just go back one minute to the, the previous slide and you see the area with abundant water, the forested area, and then look at the area in purple, I believe. Uh, that area was the area that the Europeans took for themselves. So essentially they took the fertile land for themselves and used it for agriculture. The Africans who were living in the land were moved out. They were confined in native reserves that were uh, very small and they were mostly in arid and semi-arid areas that were not conducive to agriculture. This type, of, uh, this type of practice greatly interfered with the African communities, food production systems, with their, legal, with their social and legal institutions. It was a big disruption to them. And there was, uh, it's natural that there was some resistance to this disruption. In, in, uh, in, in the third part of this presentation, I will talk about some of the consequences of this resistance. I have put a slide uh, of one of the latest sad events that happened in Kenya in 2007, 2008, of communities trying to fight back to get their land, trying to fight back to evict some of the people that they considered were foreigners. And as you can see, most of the deaths happened in the Rift Valley. But these types of resistance, this type of uh, manifestations of instability, man, uh, disequilibrium within the communities started from way back, even during the colonial era. Uh, as we know, there was, um, uh, first of all, the Maasai community brought a case against, uh, against the European uh, settler, settler community because of the loss of their land. This case was brought way back in 1912, where the Maasai organized themselves and tried to get back their land. They, lo they lost the case, but it's, a, it's an example of the community fighting to get back their land. The Nandi and the Kipsigis community waged wars, first of all, against Arabs and then against the Europeans as well, uh, which they lost. Uh, there was a famous uh, case of, uh, of, uh, of the killing of the, the Nandi leader, Koitalela Rap Samoe, in 1905. And the Kukuyu community brought uh, the Mau Mau uprising that, uh, that I think uh, there's a lot that's been written about. And, and so these are, these are examples of communities trying to get back their land. What, what we do realize from systems theory is that when a system is disrupted, so like the community systems are disrupted, then there's instability, there's a lack of equilibrium and the communities fight back to try and regain this stability and regain the equilibrium. And this was recognized even by the colonial government. And that's why the colonial government tried to bring uh, methods and ways to stabilize the community. The first method was uh, around 1954, when they started with the Swinerton plan. It was called a plan to intensify the development of African agriculture. And I'm trying to, to go fast because I'm sure my time is running out. Uh, the Swinerton plan of 1954 was started by the, 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 the colonial regime. And essentially what the colonial regime was trying to do was to develop a cadre of African farmers to, to uh, 
empower some individual Africans to become farmers in the model of the European farmer. And they thought that by having an elite African group, then there would be some stability. And this is, uh, yeah. this is key to this discussion. Because for such a system to work, they had to basically marginalize the communities themselves. They had to uh, wage a war against the customary practices of this community. And the Swinton plant's uh, success depended on the extinguishing, extinguishing the African customary practices. So you would see a lot of propaganda about these African customary practices. So for example, there was propaganda about Africans misusing the land. There was propaganda about Africans being unable to successfully farm if they followed their customary practices. And so most of these discussions did not have any basis. There was no data to support it. And interestingly enough, there was no discussion of the, sh the shifting cultivation methods of the, the Kipsigis and the Nandi, for example, or even the pastoralism methods of the Maasai that allowed the grass to regenerate. There was no such discussion. There was just generalized talk. And, and so the Swiniton plan, uh, I, I call it an assimilationist plan. Uh, predictably, it did not succeed. Although it is the same plan that continued even after independence in Kenya, because the, the first constitution of Kenya did not recognize community land rights. And I come, I come now to the last topic of uh, transformative law reform, because the, uh, with the failure of the Suneton plan, and, uh, and, and obviously the inability to, to even effectuate it in Kenya, because by, by uh, I would say by 2012, uh, which was uh, about 10 years ago, nine or 10 years ago, only about 4 million title deeds had been issued in Kenya. The country itself was approaching 45 million people and only about 4 million title deeds and under 30% of the country had been registered, uh, had gone through the system of registration where land rights were now under the formal statutory legal framework. So basically the communal tenure framework continued. This, was, this, this framework was resilient and it's the, the system that was there by default. And at some point in uh, 2009, the government was forced through a national land policy to recognize it. And then in 2010, a constitution was passed that uh, formally now recognized communal tenure. So uh, when I know, just a couple more minutes left, if you can um, just sort of um, get towards the uh, concluding points. Yes, thank you very much. So I, I, I just want to end on a note of transformative law reform. So when you see the government enacting this communal uh, tenure recognition framework in Kenya, it's an acknowledgement that the communities need to be allowed to play a role in the socioeconomic system of Kenya. And through this communal tenure framework, there's a, legal, there, there's a legal infrastructure that's been created. And my belief in transformative law reform is that if this communal tenure framework is implemented, then perhaps uh, we will start to move to that point where the interaction between the communities and the state statutory system is one of recognition. It's one of recognition based on mutual respect based on, on, on mutual dignity, based on mutual integrity. And I believe this is possible through transform, transformative law reform, but there has to be a government willingness to implement the communal tenure framework. And also, as a, as, as a last point, uh, there, there, are some, there are some flaws in the communal tenure framework, even the new one that's been recognized in the 2010 constitution. For example, it does not address historical land injustices. And one of the things that it does is that it, it, uh, it leaves this whole aspect of historical land injustices to the National Land Commission, which is, 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 is itself uh, a, state, a state organ. So I argue that the government should allow the court system itself to be able to address these kinds of land reforms, uh, uh, historical injustices, and even arising disputes between the community system and the, the, the state statutory system. The court success, access to justice through the courts may be able to provide a counterbalancing to the inherently uh, dominant interface that existed before. And as I say, I believe that this through transformative law reform, the country can move towards a recognition framework. Uh, thank you. I yield back to the moderator. Uh, thanks, uh, 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 um, George. That was, that was very sort of interesting, and um, it was great to get a perspective from um, from from East Africa as well. Um, our final speaker will take us back to to Ghana and back to the area of um, water. She's in the person of um, Dr. Arabaje, Bernadette Arabaje, um, who will be addressing us on customary laws 
and water resource governance um, in Ghana, the gender dynamics of the same. Uh, Dr. Ajay um, has uh, been in the water sector for the last um, 15 um, years and is the uh, chief legal officer of the Ghana water resource issue. So Bernadette, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Victor. I'm happy to be here to share some insights on this topic. I must say I'm quite new in this area when it comes to customary law. However, I would want to share my perspective and trigger debates in this area. I'll share my screen and then start uh, the presentation. Please do. <clears throat> Okay, I hope it's uh, visible. Yes, it's visible. So, all right, thank you. So uh, this is a brief outline. Now, um, this particular topic of discussion is, is an offshoot of a broader study I did looking at water governance in Ghana, customer and formal legal frameworks. And um, what I see is two water bodies, two cultures, one country, the dynamics of customary law when it comes to fresh water resources governance and customary law. And so uh, Ghana, as has been established in previous discussions, is a poor legal state. And uh, we have a, a, a strong state controlled water governance framework where traditional authority controls over water resources was hived off to the Water Resources Commission Act and as has been written on by Sapon and the Koku Ajima on that matter. Now we find also that the state and supra state and our spinners shall go along action has sought to change existing customary laws and practices. And this study sought to understand how the changing uh, frameworks impact on customary law and also straddles a bit into um, gender dynamics. So the research issues, water uh, governance framework and customary law systems, gender dynamics and impact on human, uh, women's rights and the external influences and as, uh, attempt to change the customary norms. So this is a, a social science research, a law and social science research. The study design was to do a comparative study of those two areas. And the areas are um, the Lake Busum catchment area in Ashanti region and the Woja Lake catchment area. And using a mixed method approach of both qualitative and quantitative methods. And data was collected using both methods, so interviews and semi-structured um, questionnaires, and then focus group discussions where key people in communities were brought together to discuss these issues, and then analyze through quotes and themes. For the quantitative, a survey was undertaken where as many as 100 households were heads of households were interviewed to get their views on customary law and state law and practices, and then analyzed through chi-square analysis. So a range of findings. The first is I discovered the nature and the systems that exist when the customer law. And I categorized them that there were a group of customer norms that dealt with regulation by traditional rulers. So you find traditional rulers uh, regulating things like access to water body. So before you can go to the water body for fishing, you need permission from the traditional authority. They also perform certain rules together with the uh, fetish priest and the uh, spiritual leaders where sacrifices are carried out either to increase the bounty for fish catch or to cleanse the water body. So in one of the study areas, uh, when a dead body is found in the water, the traditional authorities have to come in to pray and pour libation to cleanse the water body. So this was an important finding for me. The norms also had aspect of control of community behavior. So access during certain periods, and especially I found that this was more towards women, that during certain periods of time, women could not go to the water body. So this was a control of community behavior. There are certain days on which people could not go to the water body. And then certain actions were also controlled, were done to control pollution. I also discovered, especially in one study area, that there was an attempt to change customary laws. And from uh, Dr. Oh. Professor Tugube's discussion yesterday, a declared customary law where through a project, a, a, through a state institution and an external uh, actor, a non-state actor um, 
UNESCO, there was an attempt to change the customary laws in one of the catchment areas. What I found very interesting was also that um, there was a desire to find out the patterns of influence. And this uh, chart is showing that as more than as many as 80% plus, the GAS and GAW are in the greater Accra region, quite a cosmopolitan area. And you find that people believe that non-state actors and traditional rulers have a lot of influence and authority when it comes to uh, water resources. And you can see it across board and also uh, go some train area, you see the orange bar quite high. Uh, communities see them as important and influential. And this was hinged on the fact that if you take um, writings as far back as 1962, where Olenu defines land as anything on it, including water. Water and land are seen as together. And then land ownership from yesterday's discussion and today, as much as 80% of land in Ghana is owned by schools, skin, traditional authorities, and private individuals. And I did an analysis, analysis of influence and power and authority and found that land ownership translated into control. And the local people still land and water are still a joint resource. Although at the state level, this has been separated into different um, entities for, for management. So you can see that from the blue bar, state laws are seen as secondary when it comes to power and control, especially in water governance. Now, I also found that water governance is heavily influenced by customary law which has a high level of acceptance, as the previous slide has shown. And a recent attempts to modernize customary laws only seems to deepen discrimination and cause challenges. And my next slide will look at that. Uh, another interesting discovery was that uh, for the two areas, the Wager Lake area is a Petrolina area, and the Bosun area is a Petrolina area. And I found a number of norms of behavior much more in the Patina area, controlling behavior of people. And a few, as I, you can see here, females cannot bath at the bank of the river to the extent that a woman in a red dress was said not to be able to go to the water. Girls do not go on Fridays. So the days, the prescribed days, you see more mention of females and all of that. And then the Matina area and the Busum chain, there were fewer uh, controls, but of course, one key issue was that women in their menstrual periods were not to go to the water body. And also washing of certain items that would um, cause pollution. So as I mentioned earlier, pollution control seemed to be an important aspect of the role of customary law. The attempt to change customary law in the projects uh, between EP and the UNESCO where there was an attempt to bring new customary laws. And in all the study communities in Bosom, the community members kept mentioning the new customary laws. So the old ones, as I categorized, no woman shall bathe in the, in the lake, a woman in their period shall not to step in the water. At the other side, it was generalized. So an attempt to remove the gender restrictions so that it was general that no one should bathe with soap in the water. And then no washing of black in spots, pots and pans. In the new laws, it said, no washing of any food in the lake. And this met with some resistance because the people indicated that washing of cooking pots led to feeding of the fish. And so it was a positive thing, but that they believe that the new laws that were being introduced, they don't consider this fully. Um, things about regulation of fish uh, nets and sizes were seen as a new phenomenon whilst in the olden uh, customary norms, it was the fish sizes and the prohibited days that were used to control um, overfishing at any point in time. No waste disposal was also a pollution control measure. And so for these changing norms, what was the level of acceptance? And these were from focus group discussions with traditional authorities. And the one question that was asked was responded to as follows. You are asking about obedience to customary laws and the UNESCO laws. I know that what I know is that the traditional laws were more like a part of us. So right from infancy, they had grown with it. And that once the, anyone hears that the chief is to perform rituals, no one dared go there. But the new ones, 
are meeting with uh, uh, some challenges when it comes to receptiveness. And then another one also said that the people from UNESCO came to us that we should help them in the dispensation and implementation of their laws. And so these attempts are changing. The declared laws were seen as imposition and the traditional authorities are to help in implementing them, but they do not feel that they were part of the process. Because if the old laws were from infancy, a new one coming in, introducing it should be in a more nuanced in a different way than an imposition to the traditional authorities. Um, another comment was that the new laws were too restrictive. Okay? And it prevents fishermen from catching particular fish. A patre, which was a delicacy in that area, the new laws said do not catch them. And people had a problem with it. And someone was saying they have been catching the fish since they were children. So why bring new laws that prevent them from catching it? The issue about bathing with soap, someone is saying that we've been bathing with soap in this water since we were children. And yes, we had abandoned fish. So why prohibiting? And so as much as there's an attempt to change the laws, it becomes important to do it in such a way that it addresses the concerns of the people. If the community members believe that these laws have worked over a period of time and the scientific research is saying otherwise, the way the introduction is done becomes important. And so in conclusion, I'll wrap up by saying that in water resources governance, customary laws are still relevant and influential, right? And that to be considered in the light of when you take integrated water resources management, the Dublin principles, SDGs, there's a, an encouragement that governance it should be done at the local level and customary law is at the local level. Yesterday's discussions were clear that these laws will be with us there in the future. And so it's important that in introducing any policies, the state must consider this. There are also systems to um, um, control community behavior in adapting these customary laws, which are seen as discriminatory, because the explanation to me was that all the gender restrictive norms had a reason. And so in an attempt to, these are still conversations that will have to be had. How do you marry the customary laws with um, constitutional rights of people? That also becomes important. And in the state's attempt to modernize customary norms, it shouldn't be seen as deepening disadvantages against people, right? And it should also not be seen as being restrictive. So the way forward, uh, for me, I believe that water governance needs to take full account of customary laws. And uh, there should be a need to seek to redirect nuances that are seemingly causing discrimination. Because the receptiveness of people at local level becomes important if they buy into it and believe that it's something that is working for their interest. Pay attention to gender dynamics, and it should be a gradual and phased um, a system. And so the picture there at the top is showing the popular patria that people were being prevented from fishing, and which at the time of my study was still being fished. And so the new laws will come, but if it is not done in a proper way, there will be challenges. So in changing Africa, how do we do this? The conversations continue. Thank you very much. So we're done. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Bernadette. Uh, uh, for a, a, a really sort of ex exciting and insightful presentation, which was done in almost the um, the, the, the ten minute um, allotted slots. Um, so we we have um, a, a period set aside for questions in a long period, about fifteen minutes, um, and we do have um, some questions uh, that have been asked in the in the Q and A panel, but. Um, I think what we can see from the from the presentations, from really from all four of them, is that um, this is not an issue that any of the um, countries, at least that have in respect of written presentations, has had a, a lot of success really um, addressing. Just um, finding that way to balance our uh, our customary rules. And and um, sort of dealing with uh, just interfacing our customer rules and our natural resource um, wealth. Um, but I'll be curious to know um, what, in your view, would be um, an interesting way forward as far as um, reform in this area. What you know? What measures um, should be taken? Um, in the in in the medium term, in, in the short term, the medium term, 
that can allow for um, our customary structures to be reformed in a way that will allow them to play, firstly, a more sort of positive beneficial role, because that's not, not always been the case, but also just have a more um, uh, a more sort of influential role in um, in in creating some reform in this area. What coalition can be created to allow for reform in this area in in, in your respective countries? And um, I think I'll, I'll start um, if if he doesn't mind um, with Mr. Fordham with George. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Broby. And uh, uh, thank you also for that question. Because uh, in my view, I think what I found was that these customary um, structures, the, the traditional uh, systems have been struggling to find their space within the Kenyan socioeconomic system. It's been a struggle for them right from the moment of disruption by colonialism. And what we are beginning to see, particularly with the 2010 constitution, is the creation of, of a space for them in this formal structure. Because previously, they, they were excluded from the formal structure. And there was actually active state policies to exclude the customary practices, to, to, to suppress and to dominate the community systems. And so now we are seeing the state realizing in its wisdom that that exclusion, that domination, is unsustainable. It actually creates a, an instability risk to the state itself. And so the state is taking steps to start including these community systems in the discussion, to include them in the formal process. And I think that what should be done in the immediate future is a genuine implementation of this, this new structure. You know, for example, I spoke about the Swinton plan. The British government gave five million pounds for implementation of the Suniton plan, which is about 50 million pounds today. I have not heard of a budget for implementing the new communal tenor framework. I don't see, or I haven't had a discussion of a budget for that. And so I think if the state genuinely wants to implement this new, new framework, then the state needs to put resources in it. The state needs to have the political will to do it. And as well, the state also needs to subject itself to the court system whenever there are disputes whenever the, the communities themselves have grievances, the state cannot simply refer them to another department of the state. The state should be able to present itself to a neutral arbiter, which can be the court system. So I think implementation and, 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 uh, and access to justice are key issues uh, in, in, in this new structure. Right. Um, Dr. Bolanoe, uh, and, and again, it's a, it's a similar question. Do you not, um, are, are you not concerned about perhaps um, over romanticizing the role of um, um, customary law as a solution to the, um, to the water resource governance challenges that we're facing? Uh, uh, for example, the communities that are the subjects a matter of your research, assuming that we were to adopt customary law as the um, as a potential um, way forward, you know, to what extent are even the customary laws of these communities in respect to see resources even uniform um, for them to be adopted um, uh, for the purpose of which you're suggesting? Um, absolutely, which is why um, I said on the last slide that we are aware that there are challenges with even the idea of using customary law in this context. Um, Yes, indeed, um, as many of the speakers have alluded to in the past, there have been distortions and even where there haven't been distortions, um, the idea of if we think about customary law as living law, uh, 21st century living, even in those communities is perhaps different from, you know, 1800. So yes, there are those pitfalls there. However, we're approaching this really from a pragmatic perspective. We're not saying that customary law is the be all and end all of um, you know, conservation and protection of the oceans. We're saying that customary law can contribute to the existing national framework. So there is already an existing national framework. We're just hoping to surface the voices of 
those closest to the resource because at the moment often what happens is that um, we conceive the oceans as this thing which often is partly scientific but also partly legal but we often ignore the fact that it is a living breathing environment which sustains communities for many many years and not just sustenance as an economic one but like i said but also they've got um, it has value to them from many that many dimensions including cultural and spiritual dimensions and so it is one component of the legal framework and the legal framework would include uh, national laws and it would also include the science and the policy and you know all of the modern science for example climate change and so climate change would not be something which we would expect to see in customary law but it would all hopefully get integrated into one more robust legal system so to speak okay. All right. Thank, thank, thanks. For, thanks very much for that, um, uh, Professor Ubank. Um, I think the, the next question goes to you because you've had the um, the the benefits of knowledge of multiple legal systems. Um, is there actually an African country that has gotten close to getting this right? Is there a place whose um, traditional land tenure systems, combined with its um, state tenure systems, has um, developed? Um, so, uh, a process and, and uh, structures which allow for uh, a more optimal um, use of um, our, our natural resources, or is the entire continent just um, sunk? <laughs> well, thank you for that question. Um, I would definitely not claim that I know every country in, in Africa no, no. very well. So. This is the ones that you're familiar with. <laughs> I, I do have trouble, though, finding a very positive example, because I think I, I'm of the perspective that customary law plays a very important role. I'm also of the perspective that traditional leaders play an important role. But I also am of the perspective that the checks and balances on these systems have been eroded in the colonial period, in the apartheid period, etc. And I think this becomes visible when resources become very valuable. So particularly when land prices explode, whether it's because of you know, commercial exploitation of, of agriculture or land grabbing, big companies coming in or uh, urbanization, it doesn't really matter. Um, then it becomes really hard to put a check on these systems. And so for me, the whole question really is about power and it's on checks and balances. And I think it would be really great if state government and traditional government could put checks and balances on each other because neither system is perfect, right? You can say there's things wrong at the customary level, but the states are have serious problems as well. So if they could work to balance each other out, that would be very helpful. But what you often see is particularly, of course, when those resources become so valuable that elites at the state level, you know, make deals with elites at the traditional level to make sure that they much more easily get access to those resources. Because of course, it's easier to make a deal with one chief and buy him off than with a whole community, right? That's just very obvious. And it's so much money that it's not surprising that Jews are interested in it as well. So I think I think that's sort of the background. And, and this is partly what I've been sort of describing. As you know, I did my PhD on Ghana and, and I was already writing yeah. about the checks yeah. and balances and the unhappy circumstance that the Ghanaian state yeah. is more, and more saying, those are chieftaincy affairs. We shouldn't involve ourselves in that. Where chieftaincy affairs, of course, you could take that as issues of who is the rightful chief, but you can also take it at anything they're involved in and then basically put everything with land under it as well. And I think now in South Africa, it's going very wrong because of the fact that these two groups are not putting checks and balances on each other, but together teaming up to disenfranchise the customary communities. Oh, I'm sorry, this is wow. definitely not the hopeful story you were hoping to <laughs> <laughs> to, to be perfectly honest, I wasn't expecting a, a particularly positive response. I, I, um, I, um, it, it, it's an, in no country that I, I have been to have I um, heard um, 
a story in, re in respect of natural resources that um, sort of demonstrated that you know the country was sort of getting it right. And, and actually, um, in some countries, it was getting significantly worse. And, and, and this sort of goes to the, to the last question for the panel, um, uh, Dr. Jay. Um, in, your, in your presentation, you, um, you uh, I think, and this may have me the focus, you, you appear to omit one sort of important driver of behavior in this way, in, in this area, which is the pollution caused by mining and uh, and and um, Galanze and the um, our far eastern um, uh, visitors in this sector. Um, to what extent um, is that changing the way in which there has been a, a response to water resources, either either gendered or more broadly speaking, in, in terms of customary law? Okay. And, and is so, there a customary law response? to what is happening to our water resources as a result of um, Kalamze. Okay. So really, I think you've really triggered a very important point. And I've always made this argument that looking at the power structures at the local level, where land ownership is a key issue when it comes to control and power at the local level. If access to the water through land is to be controlled, traditional authorities must be fully on board when it comes to control of pollution. Traditionally, there were enough norms that controlled pollution. But then when the state took over, the state is removed. And that was one key factor I saw. The state is removed from the local communities. But in every community, there's a traditional ruler. And so the discussions as to how do we rope in traditional authority, a Professor Santi said in the earlier discussion about how the introduction of chiefs into this system is really piecemeal, being on a board somewhere or the other. But how do you get access to lawmaking and access to enforcement? Most of the discussions in my focus group discussions that came up, traditional authorities were saying, we only have the moral right to control people's behavior. We do not have the policing and enforcing role. Mm -hmm. And so the, the change has to come from some, and it starts from talking really and writing. And I'm hoping that in, in this area, we can be more expansive in Ghana and realize that, look, it will happen at the local level, <laughs> everywhere, and we need to manage it at that level. So that's my response. We, we need to continue the debate. Great. Thank Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm getting strong signals and I need to wrap up because the we're right over as far as the next panel is concerned. So um, I'm going to sort of end uh, by thanking all our distinguished um, panelists, Prof. Prof. Ubing, um, Dr. J, um, Dr. Reno, um, Mr. Fordham. Um, I, this, this has been um, extremely insightful. I, I've learned um, uh, a, a lot um, has gotten some good ideas for research going forward, and I look forward to um, engaging um, all of you in um, sort of other capacities um, very shortly. Yeah, thank you. So uh, let me hand it back over to our moderator, Madam Gertrude Armour. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Bobby, for such a wonderful uh, job done. Indeed, yes, I have also learned a lot from our speakers. And uh, I'd like to introduce our very final panel for this conference and for today as well. Um, we do acknowledge the fact that uh, we seem to have um, taken a bit more time, but I think all in all, it has been a great session. So we'll plead with you to bear with us, even as we go through the very final panel for the conference. Our, our final panel is on African customary law and contemporary challenges, indeed cross-cutting issues. And I think uh, we couldn't have ended this uh, conference on a better note than, uh, you know, with a, with a panel such as, uh, such as we have next. Now the moderator for this panel is no other person than Dr. Kweku Ajiman Budu. Dr. Budu is a practicing lawyer and he's also a law lecturer at the Faculty of Law of the Ghana Institutes of Management and Public Administration here in Ghana. So without much ado, I'll hand over quickly to Dr. Kweku Ajiman Budu. Doc, can you hear me? Hello. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Doc, we can hear you. Over to you. All right. So good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the final panel, um, the final session of this all important um, conference and I appreciate the fact that we are a little behind time and so we'll try to do this 
um, as quickly as possible, but still delve into the matters that we need to delve into in order to exhaust the topic and appreciate the context within which the topic will be um, discussed. This panel, of course, is the panel on African customary law and contemporary challenges, cross captain issues. And when we talk about customary law, um, reference is always made, for instance, in our particular circumstances here in Ghana to the constitution of Ghana, because we know that in as much as we have the formal laws, um, if we may put it that way, the constitution also guarantees customary law, which means the rules and um, rules of law, which by custom are applicable to particular communities within um, Ghana. And I believe that it is um, similar in other parts of the continent as well. And we'll get some perspectives on some of these issues as we go along. So um, let me quickly introduce the panel panelists. Um, and if the panelists are all here, I would urge them to um, turn on their, 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 their videos for the introduction and then we can, we can move on. So the first speaker and, and maybe before so we, we, we go on, I'll just say that each of the panelists that I'm about to introduce will have approximately 10 minutes to make their submissions. We would appreciate it if you can um, make it um, um, earlier than 10 minutes if it's possible. Um, but obviously you still have 10 minutes to make your submissions and um, each panelist is going to have an equal um, amount of time to make their submissions. And at the end of all the presentations, I'll ask a few questions directed at the panelists and then uh, uh, attendees who are here may also ask questions as they've been asking us. We have gone along in this conference. So the first um, panelist that I'd like to introduce is in the person of Professor Dunya P. Zongwe. Um, professor Zongwe is an associate professor at the Walter Sisulu University of South Africa. Prof, if you can hear us, welcome. You, you can unmute your mic just to say welcome. Yes, so that we yes. hear you. Yes, can you all hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much, Professor, for joining us. The okay. second person that we have, our second panelist, is uh, my very good friend, um, Dr. Nenna Ifeinyi Ajufo, who is a senior lecturer of law and technology at the Hillary Rotham um, Clinton School of Law at the Swansea University of United Kingdom. Dr. Nena, can you hear me? Absolutely. Thank you, Kweku. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, our third panelist. Uh, um, our third panelist is um, Professor Anthony C. Diala. Um, I, I don't know if Prof. Diala is here. I don't think Prof. Diala is. Is, is Prof. Diala here? Yes. Oh, oh yes. Yes, Prof. I'm here Diala. and I'll turn on my camera in due time. Wonderful. Prof. Diala is an associate professor of law and the director of the Center for Legal Integration in Africa at the University of Western Cape. And um, that's um, um, Professor, you just heard um, him. Welcome, Professor, to this panel. And in due time, attendees will get to see um, you. And then finally, we have, um, no, not finally, we, we have um, Lerato Rudolph in Guenyama who is, I hope I got the name right, who is an LLD candidate at Stellenbosch University um, in South Africa, who will also be speaking to us um, soon. Um, Lerato, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, sir. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us today. And then finally, um, uh, last but definitely not the least, we have Luisa Acabado, who is a research um, 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 a, a visiting researcher, I believe, at the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology. Um, Louisa, are you here? Can you hear us? Yes, perfectly. Excellent. Thank you all for you. taking time out of your very busy schedules, I can imagine, to join us in this particular um, conference and agreeing to present um, papers in this regard. So without wasting too much time, I will hand over to you, um, and we've already gone through the ground rules, 10 minutes to make the submissions. If you can do it um, within the time frame without necessarily exhausting the 10 minutes, that would be excellent. But obviously you still have 10 minutes to make your submissions. Um, if you want to share PowerPoint slides, you can 
um, share your screen and I believe um, we will all be able to follow um, in that regard. So um, Professor Dunya um, Zongwe, please, um, over to you for your presentation. Professor Zongwe will be presenting the paper on when customary law meets commerce, excavating the value of communal trust to rebuild commercial law. That I believe is an important topic and it's going to be interesting. So um, we'll be taking notes so that we'll be able to ask the appropriate questions um, when it's time for the Q&A. So Professor Zongwe, please over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Can you, um, can you all see my slide? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So I uh, will start now, uh, 10 minutes. You uh, can expand it so that it, it covers the whole screen. Yes, the, um, I was about to do that. Okay, so um, good uh, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Dunya Zongwe. Uh, the title of my presentation, as it was mentioned, is When Customary Meets Commerce, excavating the value of communal trust to rebuild commercial law. The title already gives you an indication that the overall theme of my presentation would hold that um, in order to decolonize commercial law um, in Africa, the value of communal trust can provide a powerful foundation for that um, endeavor. Almost instinctively, lawyers uh, place uh, African customary laws under the category of public law or private law. You just need to look at the um, curriculum, the legal curriculum of most, if not all, law faculties, and you'll realize that when customary laws as a module features in the curriculum, um, it would either fall under the, the general heading of public law or private law. As a consequence, um, it's only a, a handful of researchers who have looked into the role that customary laws or customary contracting could play in governing um, modern commercial law. I put modern in inverted commas because I am subverting the, uh, the old notion of modernity and I'll say more about that. In fact, questions about the pertinence of customary laws for uh, uh, commerce usually translate ideas and beliefs that customary laws have remained primitive and that odds with uh, human rights. So the lack of research on customary contracting leaves a disturbing gap in modern uh, commercial law. And it also betrays the whole project of decolonizing the law in Africa, decolonizing knowledge in Africa. So educators, policymakers cannot ignore customary law because of the vital role that it performs in commerce, in the economy, in inter-African trade and the prosperity um, of people uh, on the continent. So, my presentation delves into customary contracting and it also explores the possibilities of repurposing modern um, commercial law so that it can be in tune with the value of trust in uh, customary contracting. To fulfill that task, I have divided my presentation in two parts. In the first part, I'll be looking at communal trust, in other words, trust in uh, customary commerce and in the second half, of my presentation, I'll be looking at um, avenues for infusing, uh, I mean, possible avenues for infusing communal trust in uh, modern uh, commercial law. Um, obviously, there are different ideas, different uh, learned and um, dictionary definitions of trust, but for the purposes of my presentation, um, I understand trust to mean situations where, especially in the context of commerce, uh, I, I define it as a situation where a person firmly uh, believes that another person uh, possesses certain uh, qualities that relate to honesty. For example, reliability, fairness, truth, or ability. Uh, and uh, such firm belief will hold even in the absence of evidence. But that said, trust in the customary uh, commerce context is not the same as trust in business organizations. We're not talking about business entities or how uh, business should be um, organized. Instead, we're talking about trust as a fundamental value. And in that sense, it is different from uh, trust as it's used in modern um, commerce. So very importantly, uh, communal trust uh, focuses on relationships. By contrast, uh, the basis of trust in modern commerce is transactional in the sense that it focuses on transactions as opposed to uh, relational. So unlike... Um, Communal trust, uh, modern commerce, uh, I mean, trust in modern commerce is transactional, individualistic, self-centered, 
if not um, selfish, adversarial and opportunistic. And this comes from the fact that it is um, heavily influenced by the liberal ideas behind most of our understanding of, uh, of, of economics. In customary commerce, trust conveys and it conjures up ideas of community, reciprocity, solidarity, and interdependence. Given these uh, notions, you may think, but well, what's the difference between the trust and uh, Ubuntu? Because Ubuntu seems to share some of the ideas. We'll have the time to discuss this in the um, uh, Q and A session. But what I can say for the moment is that community, uh, communal trust relates to Ubuntu, at least in so far as they both emphasize mem uh, membership in a certain community, the values of uh, community and communalism. But there are other ways in which they, they relate. Uh, communal trust comes from both contracts in so far as it involves the exchange of commodities. Of course, what is a tradable com uh, commodity is open to, may differ from community to community and is open to question. But it also comes from personal status, uh, membership, uh, in so far as it uh, um, emphasizes membership in a community. Um, but that may be problematic. Because the question that you may ask yourself is communal trust or commu uh, customary contracting really commercial? And by commercial here, I understand, is it motivated by profit? Um, on the one hand, you have scholars like Archinson and Simbanda who actually say that, well, um, if you look at customary contracting, it's mostly about um, um, status. Uh, but if that is the case, then um, it is a misnomer to describe communal trust as commercial. And that may even explain why in the scholarship, um, the majority of scholars actually look at uh, customary contracting as part of uh, public law or private law. But on the other hand, I uh, observe that in different communities across space and time, there's been a search for uh, the exchange of commodities, of course, and services, but also a search to gain from that perspective and to that extent, we can say that both communal trust and customary contracting as an element of um, commercial law. But while you may think of other ways in which, um, because you may ask yourself, well, but I rather believe that it's private and public as opposed to commercial. But while you are pondering on that, I would like to uh, look at communal trust and how it can be used in contemporary um, uh, uh, commercial law. One of the things that struck me as I was looking at the literature is the fact that um, it is under theorized. It is under theorized. One of the things that struck me is that the very small body of knowledge on customary contracting mentions decolonization sometimes as goals and sometimes as background objective, but they do not uh, utilize decoloniality or decolonial theories. And that is a problem because, I, and I will explain that in the concluding remarks of my presentation. But let me say for the time being that decolonial uh, theory mostly focuses on modernity, on the modernity coloniality question. In other words, uh, unlike established theories, it equates uh, um, modernity with colonialism. And it presents modernity as a myth, a myth uh, that actually heavily relies on law, including commercial law, on power and on science. Uh, and from the Renaissance to the ongoing neoliberal globalization, coloniality has over the centuries disqualified and discredited non-European knowledge, including um, cast African customary laws. And in that process, both modern science and modern law have helped the tremendous rise of modernity. In commercial law, coloniality would manifest through three vehicles, but there may, may be others, but very important ones include uh, doctrinalism or what we call black later law, individualism, and neoliberal economic theory. So coming to the crux of what I was uh, hoping to do today, the question is how can communal trust then help reform or reshape the following, I mean, commercial law? It can do so through a number of principles, practices, uh, or notions, uh, including notably freedom of contract, good faith, Tata Sutsa Rwanda, which is the, uh, a Latin expression that conveys uh, the importance that uh, agreements be honored. It can also uh, help uh, reform commercial law uh, by affecting or changing considerations of public policy in contracting. Uh, it, also, it can also affect privity of contract and collateral insecure credit transactions. This is not a, an exhaustive list, but just to give you an idea of how it can change. And then to just illustrate briefly, very briefly what I'm talking about, imagine privity of contract. 
Privity of contract says that a person can only get um, uh, rights or incur obligations in terms of a contract if he has signed that contract. Third parties do not get uh, rights or obligations in terms of the contract. With the communal trust, um, you can have a situation where um, the, the relatives or members of the community of the employee can actually sue, although they don't have rights under the contract, can in certain circumstances sue the employer if they are directly affected by a breach of the contract on the side of the employer. This is just an example, but Sorry coming back to the bigger picture. Sorry? Sorry to interrupt you, Paul, but you have about one minute remaining. If you can and, I'm and I'm concluding also, <laughs> no problem. So um, to reiterate my main theme, to decolonize modern commercial law and uh, uh, restore the values of customary contracting from the vestiges of the law, we uh, lawyers will need to excavate communal trust. It's not the only principle that can uh, help in the reform, but it's an important one. Unfortunately, the biggest hill to climb in this case is the fact that this uh, scholarship on Af uh, contracting in uh, um, African customary laws can barely serve to uh, decolonize uh, and to unshackle, um, um, I mean, commercial law. And this is because it is mostly on the theorized. One of the things, as I said, that struck me as I was going through the literature is that the, although that scholarship promotes and extols the virtues of African customary laws, uh, it hardly confirms the coloniality of um, modern commercial law, neither does it actually um, challenge or question the neoliberal ideology behind that field of law. I'll ask you a very quick question. Uh, if you think of it, can you recall a situation where you taught or were being taught commercial law by uh, in a way that connected the rules and the principles of commercial law to the microeconomic uh, neoliberal principles that actually influence them? Most of the time that link is invisible and it's difficult to decolonize if that link is not made clear. In other words, it's, it's a good thing that scholars, especially in South Africa, have started questioning some aspects of commercial law as it has been inherited uh, from the British and from Roman Dutch, uh, from the Roman Dutch inheritance. But uh, decolonization demands more. In other words, another way of, of putting it is to say that it is not because you have started moving in a different direction that you have escaped our straitjacket. It's not because we have started moving in a different direction that you have escaped our neoliberal colonial straight jacket. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor um, Zongwei, for that brilliant presentation, um, which, I mean, you said it all. I have questions that I have noted down, which we'll, we'll come to once we get to um, that point. I believe some of our attendees will have questions as well, but thank you for largely sticking um, to the time. You exceeded your time by a minute or two, but we can forgive you um, for, for, for that. So um, let's move on now to the next presentation, which is going to be by Dr. Nena Ifeni Ajufo, who, like I said, is a senior lecturer of law and technology at the Hillary Rodham Clinton School of Law, um, located at the Swansea University in the United Kingdom. And Dr. Nena, We'll be talking about law and technology, exploring new legal frontiers for African customary law. So, Nena, you have um, 10 minutes as well, beginning now. Thank you, Kweku. Thank you. Um, I just want to share my screen, please. Good afternoon, everyone. And I must say thank you to the organizers of the conference for giving me such a privilege to discuss African customary law and contemporary challenges. And um, before, I must, uh, before I start, I, I want to say thank you to Professor Galizi for reiterating that indeed change is happening. A lot of change um, changes are going on. For example, traditional knowledge and folklore within the conceptions of intellectual property is beginning to change as a discourse when we consider globalization and digitalization. The ownership rights of women, you know, perceived true customary lenses are beginning to change when you think about the fact that women are beginning to have a digital identity. Women are beginning to have virtual properties and things like that. So that discourse is as well changing. The conceptions of gender in cyberspace, you know, beginning to change different from what we 
um, conceive of them in terms of um, African customary law. So indeed, a lot of change is going on. And one of those changes as well is understanding and discussing the advancement of customary law in a digital age. So this evening, I would like to conceptualize the advancement of African customary law within the discourse of law and technology. And I, I started by you know, thinking about the dictum of um, Justice Ago. Um, this was over 30 years ago, but I think it sort of gives essence to my discussion this evening. He was of the opinion 30 years ago when he was berating the non-codification of African customary law. He said that the result is that our customary law is still treated like foreign law in our own lands, our own countries, after our independence from colonial rule. And he said, this is far from satisfactory. Much as I agree that those with those who believe that codification will have the effect of stratifying customary law and inhibiting its growth, I believe that something can be done to rescue it from the fluttering uncertainty and contemptible inferior status to which it is now subjected. It is to be regretted, however, that whereas the authorities concerned are taking the commendable step of reading our statute and received English law of anachronism, nothing appears to be happening in the area of customary law, which forms the essential backbone of our corpus juris. So I thought of thinking about the fact that we are talking about, you know, one thing that has resonated in this conference is the fact that, you know, African customary law is relegated. There have been calls for restatement of African customary law. Most times that discussion is devoid of the place of technology, the role of emerging digital technologies and innovative technologies towards a restatement or advancement of African customary law. Now, what is the perception of African customary law in a digital age? And I believe that it is imperative to begin this dialogue focused on attaining an interpretative approach that would ensure the reform and advancement of African customary law in line with contemporary realities. You know, Professor Ndulo talked about the fact that social change is happening and we cannot keep arguing that, you know, African law will not be susceptible to social changes. So, like I said, there have been calls for restatement of African customary law in both academic and political discourses, yet a missing discussion is the role that technology can play in the advancement of African customary law. So it is an important inquiry that we should engage in on whether the digitalization of the African customary law system is a way forward. And digitalization is increasingly becoming a critical factor in governance, in law enforcement, in the dispensation of justice. Digitalization is well underway in many developed jurisdictions in the EU in terms of access to justice, in terms of forwarding the legal system. Digitalization and digital transformation have become very important factors. And so undoubtedly, the future of law and legal system is being shaped by digital technologies and Africa cannot be left out. Africa will not be left out. So when compared with, of course, developing country or developed countries, the level of digital penetration is lower in places like Africa. But then digitalization is a complex phenomenon and that will affect every jurisdiction. Not only is Africa by far, you know, the least digitalized region, it also lacks the minimal infrastructure. And I think that poses a problem for African customary law, because you know, if we think about the digital revolution and how it proceeds and how it is, you know, advancing, irregardless of the deficiencies in Africa, then African customary law potentially faces the possibility of further relegation. We're already saying it's relegated. You know, Professor Ndulo said there is already an integration in the system, but then the African customary law is relegated. And so imagine how the advancements, the penetration of technology would further relegate um, African customary law when people do not have access to technologies. And so we must begin to think about how to forward that discourse. And perhaps the call for the restatement of African customary law may progress as a viable agenda if we begin to place African customary law within the discourse of understanding this shift that is taking place in the digital age. 
And there are benefits in legal automation, data analytics, um, machine learning, blockchain technology, and I'll talk about this um, shortly. But then there are main issues for debate, and I try to contextualize this in four parts. The first one, which we've all been talking about, is the codification of customary law. And my question is, is the continued non-codification of customary law a challenge to its viability and, and development? Will technology enhance this issue, the harmonization. I'm careful at times not to say unification because indeed there are so many customs, many tribes, many regions. Is unification even so much of a possibility? So I tend to talk about it in terms of harmonization. Is the harmonization and integration of customary law through the application of technology a possibility? Another issue that is always, you know, resonates is the ascertainment and authentication of customary laws. Now, before an African customary law is relied upon, there must be proof that it exists. And we know all this, you know, the courts must take judicial notice or it may be through proving the existence of the customary law. Now, when the customary law is invoked and is not judicially noticed, the person invoking must prove so at times we have to rely on oral accounts, experts, you know, um, witness, expert opinions, non-expert opinions. We have to rely on decisions, earlier decisions in relation to application of customary law. We have to rely on books and all of that. And this has been a dilemma because sometimes the system is fraught with concerns of bias, unpredictability, uncertainty, lack of transparency, and what um, have you, some of those issues um, affected with it. Again, we are all conscious of the fact that recognition and applicability of customs continues to remain a dilemma because of the repugnancy doctrine. Now, before customary law is recognized, particularly in my own jurisdiction where I come from, it must not be repugnant to natural justice, equity, and good conscience. It must not be incompatible with the law that is for the time being in existence. And the meaning of this test remains unclear until today. But arguments have been based on the fact that we have to be sure that, you know, this is not repugnant. We have to be sure that it is in consonance with contemporary realities. So that application of repugnancy doctrine has been subjective. And once the customary law in question is ascertained, it would still undergo the repugnancy test. So this continuous strict proving and testing of customs for me should ordinarily be regarded as unnecessary in this age and time. We can do away with the irrational modes of proof and decisions and avoid these complex systems, the complex you know, relations in terms of trying to prove what is viable, what exists, what is not prejudicial. And so it has created a system susceptible to bias and prejudice sometimes. And lastly, we have to think about access to justice for people who still practice or who are still subject to African customary law. African customary law is not going anywhere. One minute. Really? Yes. If you could wrap up for us, please. OK. So what are the things? How do we explore new legal frontiers? Um, there are so many things that technology can do. You know, it can enhance court methods of judicial notice. Artificial intelligence can transcribe accounts of customary practices. We can translate relevant materials into digital forms. Artificial intelligence and blockchain can be adopted for predictive justice. And this will enhance you know, predictive analysis. It will enhance court process automation as well. And of course, digital record keeping will enhance certainty, innovation technologies. Unfortunately, I do not have time to expand on all these. Access to justice services, open court systems, and of course, um, administrative issues as well. Now, in order not to sound rhetoric, what will give value to this is national strategies and policies. And Professor Asante talked about the fact that we must go back to traditional leaders and incorporate them into policy making systems. And I stated four objectives, you know, establishing the relevant existing legal and policy framework. We have to have an inventory on what is viable and what has existed. What are the key software and products? You know, we need to identify the areas of possible interest as well. And a lot of work has to be done in terms of the African Union. 
And just because of time, I want to touch on the digital transformation strategy for Africa. In the whole of the strategy, there is no value given to judiciary or legal aspects. And I think the African Union can set up an expert group on the reform of African customary law, considering the digital realities in Africa. We must also think about a human rights framework, which is something that has been discussed over and over. Article 27 resonates in Article 15 of the ICESCR, talking about the right of everyone to benefit of scientific advancement. And we must still take advantage of Article 22 of the African Charter. There's a right to self-determination, and if people need to have access to African customary law within the framework of human rights, we must think about advancing it. Lastly, I think we can begin to discuss about a center for African customary law and technology. This, for me, is very important because we need to further research in this area and it's very important. So um, I, this has been, I don't want to believe I've used my 10 minutes quick, but I'll believe you. But then um, I'll just conclude by saying that it will be absurd to imagine any definitive verdict on how to advance customary law through technology. It is a varied and complex situation. I do not have the answer now. I can definitely say this is what it is. But indeed, I must say that, you know, Customary law is based on lived experiences. Technology can no longer be disregarded in societal experiences, and this can be translated into technological innovation focused on the peculiar challenges related to customary law. So that we must continue to conceive of ways to reconceptualize and discuss the advancement of customary law, and technology is a change that we must embrace. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nana. You spent approximately 12 minutes and 28 seconds, so you exceeded your time by two minutes and 28 seconds. So yes, I have the proof for that. But thank you nonetheless for your wonderful insight um, into customary law and technology. I have some questions that I will come back to you so that you can fill in some of the holes that you may have left out because of time. You weren't able to expand on certain um, points in your presentation. But thank you once again for um, your wonderful presentation. I now want to move on quickly to Professor Anthony Diala, who I introduced earlier. Professor Diala is an Associate Professor of Law and the Director of the Center for Legal Integration in Africa at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. And Professor Diala will be speaking on the topic, Rethinking Customary Law in Postmodern Africa. So you can see that all these topics that we are discussing are along the same lines, and that's why they are being discussed within the context of the same panel. So Professor Diala, you could take over and um, you have approximately 10 minutes to make your presentation, respectfully, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kwaku. Um, the day is far gone, so I'll cut straight to the chase. I'm going to make five claims about customary law, um, which may surprise, perhaps shock some people listening. Claim number one is that colonialism is tantamount to war. In other words, Africans were conquered. Africans are a conquered people. Um, I don't think anyone here can seriously stand up and say that the Europeans, the Western Europeans who colonized Africa asked for permission before they started. Um, even when treaties were signed, we know the circumstances in which those treaties were signed. So any third grade textbook on colonialism can reveal the true nature of colonialism and that the Africans who resisted were imprisoned, some were killed, some were maimed. We know that story. So Africans are a conquered people. Colonialism can be regarded as war. Claim number two, there are no received, or rather, the Western Europeans who colonized Africa imposed their laws on the continent. In other words, we call this legal transplant. They brought their legal systems and they brought it on African political economies. Claim number three is that the imposed laws that we have today on the continent transmuted, they adapted and transformed to become what we call state laws. Um, in South Africa, we call them the Roman Dutch law, the laws of the Dutch people, the, the laws of the British. So it's Roman Dutch law, it's state law in many African countries. So it's quite wrong to use the phrase received English law. It's not received English law, it's imposed English law. Claim number four, legal transplants, that's the laws that were transposed on African political economies um, were not done in isolation. They were accompanied by so massive socioeconomic changes, 
ranging from religion, Christianity, urbanization, new systems of work, new fashion, new foods, technology, etc. So it wasn't alone. Claim number five, the socioeconomic changes brought by legal transplants and all the other changes that I've just spoken about are too deep, too widespread, too complex and too successful to be reversed. Meaning that those who champion decolonization should take a reality check by looking in the mirror and asking themselves questions about their true legal identity. Right, now that we have these five claims out of the way, I have three M's for this paper, which I'm going to get through very rapidly. Claim number, uh, sorry, M number one is to redefine customary law. Number two is to explain or rather to present to you what I call a theory of adaptive legal pluralism. And finally, I will outline the future of legal pluralism in Sub-Saharan Africa, which of course includes the future of customary law. Right. So the reality is this, and all the statements I'm making, the, the presentation I'm making is based on field work that I, conduct, I conducted in Nigeria and in Somaliland, an empirical work done by the NRF chair, National Research Foundation chair in customary law at the University of Cape Town, where I studied. The reality is that Sub-Saharan Africa is struggling with a Western-driven modernity that is firmly captured in the legacy of colonialism. And a key aspect of this struggle is the coexistence of indigenous African laws with the laws that were imposed by Western Europeans on the continent. Now, given the agrarian origins, the agricultural origins of the former, that's indigenous laws, and the industrial nature of the latter, the imposed laws, we have a situation that we call conflict of laws. We teach it in the university. Many of our students grow up um, with conflict of laws emphasis on those, but I'll, I'll get back to this. Now, to redefine African customary law, we really need to go back to all the comments that were made about African singular use. We know that customary laws, cultural pluralism, customs differ from community to community, but we have to redefine what African customary laws mean. Now, in the past, communities lived close together for two reasons, for defense, for agriculture. So they hunted together, farmed together, communal living. People did not really get to know other people in other communities. And laws had a communal nature for the welfare of the group. Whereas the laws that were imposed on the continent are relatively industrial in nature. The first industrial revolution was occurring by the time the British were coming here, the French and the rest of them. So you see industrial laws with industrial character being imposed on agricultural communities. What could go wrong? Uh, due to the, the radical nature of the socioeconomic changes that were brought by the imposed laws, Africans started adapting their indigenous laws towards these changes. So today, for instance, we have the constitution. As the face of state laws, we have the Bill of Rights. Everybody worships the constitution. Every lawyer worships the constitution. Something that is relatively younger than indigenous African laws. But that's by the way, so how then do we define customary law? Customary law are the adaptations of indigenous norms. In other words, the indigenous norms that are adapted to the socioeconomic changes of globalization, of which colonialism is the most important. That's the definition of customary law. Now, indigenous African laws are the remnants of pre-colonial norms that people still observe in their ancient formats. The clearest example is the mere primogeniture rule. When this rule emerged, um, like I said, communities lived close together. A strong male was needed to defend the family, to act as mediator between the spirits, the material world and the immaterial world. And so that's the origin. He inherited property on behalf of the family, not for his own benefit, for the benefit of the family. That's primogeniture. Now, when communities still practice it, it is indigenous African law. If they say, no, times have changed, all the male children should inherit. It is no longer indigenous law. It is African customary law. If they also say, no, due to the effect of the constitution, due to religion, Christianity, etc., every children, male and female, will inherit equally. It is also African customary law, no longer indigenous law. So you see the difference? Those laws that are applied in their ancient formats in pre-colonial times as if 
the times have not changed. Those are indigenous African laws. Those that have changed and responded to changes are African customary laws. So the last category of laws on the continent, what we call state laws, enough said about those ones. So what is the significance of this definition? If we accept that laws are the practices to which people attach a sense of obligation, then it becomes easy to see the new identity of laws on the continent. So it's easy then to see this distinct category that we call customary law needing to be reshaped and re-understood as a mixture of imposed laws and indigenous practices. And then to also to see the influence of state laws, the, the, the influence of state laws, the force, the way it compels indigenous laws to adapt towards it through the Bill of Rights, through judicial pronouncements, through codifications, etc. And so I argue that the interaction of laws in sub-Saharan Africa, that is legal pluralism, is imitative and reflective of coloniality. Coloniality being the condition of the colonized. So those patterns of persistent patterns of power and philosophy left behind by colonialism, that's coloniality. Interaction of laws on the continent reflect imitation, indigenous laws gravitating towards the imposed laws and also reflects coloniality, the effects of colonial rule. And this predicts the future of laws on the African continent. Um, those who know the history of the English common law would know that it emerged from the melding of English customs, the measure of English customs with the laws imposed by the Romans and the Normans at different historical periods. So English law, common law is actually customary law and that's the feature of laws on the continent. Maybe in 500 years, in 300 years, 200, 50 years, who knows? Customary law will merge with state laws and produce a common law on the continent. That is the feature of laws on the continent. And that is why last year in October, we set up a center for legal integration in Africa at the University of the Western Cape. Um, I'm happy to take questions, um, but more on the, the, the presentation I've made today is coming, is coming out in an article very soon. And also information can be found on our website, which I'm happy to share with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Diala. You spent um, just nine minutes. You were right within the time setting out those five claims, um, which we will push you further on um, soon enough. Um, um, I believe you've gone ahead to do some other things. We'll, we'll talk about that um, shortly as well. Thank you for your presentation. Um, let's quickly move on to the last but one presenter um, in the person of Lerato Rudolph Nguanyama, who, like I said earlier on, is an LLD candidate at Stellenbosch University in Stellenbosch, South Africa. And he will be talking about attending customary initiation school in South Africa during the COVID-19 pandemic era. That's the topic for this particular presentation. So um, Lerato, if you can hear me, you can take over and you have 10 minutes that starting now. Thank you, moderator, for the opportunity. And thank you for the organizers of the committee for the invitation to come and participate in this wonderful conference. It is a privilege for me. Uh, just to mention, I'm no longer an LLD candidate. I've already met, I've now met the requirements of Doctor of Law. So the Senate, the Research Committee and the Senate of Stan Bosch has conferred the degree on me. So when I was congratulations, Dr. Lerato Nguenyama. We will accord you the appropriate um, title since you've joined the ranks. Um, um, Thank now. I'm, happy, I'm happy to induct you into uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. By way of an introduction, um, every year in South Africa, young men and young women that are excited to undergo the customary practice of initiation. In South Africa, initiation refers to any customary cultural, ritual, or ceremonial practice that takes place in the initiation school in line with the customs and traditions of that particular community. The customary practice of initiation further includes teachings that relate to ideas, values, aspirations, and respect. As such, 
many communities in South Africa or many communities in South Africa, they embrace this particular cult cultural activity. And it is regarded as sacred and respected customary practice that marks the preparation of initiates to become responsible adult men and women in the society. So the customary, customary law practice is generally, it generally entails circumcision. In relation to young women, circumcision removed to the, refers to the removal of their cyclotoris. And in relation to men, on the other hand, it, re, it refers to the surgical removal of their foreskin, either wholly or partially, as part of the customary initiation in that particular community. But sadly, this year, young men and women, they were not able to undergo this practice due to the national lockdown necessitated by the COVID-19 pandemic. In this regard, the South African government was compelled to promulgate regulations that could ensure that young men and women do not undergo customary practice initiation so that they are safe and sufficiently protected from the COVID-19 pandemic while in their respective homes. So the aim of this paper, it is to have evaluate the government's response to the COVID-19 particularly, to the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly looking at how it affected the practice of initiation in our country. So first, the paper will, will look at what measures were put in place by our government to regulate initiation schools, were the measures due to government's regulation or did the initiation school conductors simply recognize the need to prevent the spread of COVID-19 by shutting down customary schools? More importantly, the paper will also consider the, the, any constitutional implications in this regard, looking at how the, our government responded to the COVID-19. Moving right along to South Africa's response to COVID-19 and prohibiting the attendance of customary initiation schools. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, South African government has implemented various measures. These measures include a national wide lockdown in which everyone was required to stay at home, observe social distancing, and ensure regular washing of hands and sanitizing. However, these measures are extremely difficult to implement initiation schools, whereby initiates are closely packed together and they, are, they only have access to running water through a river or a pond. Sometimes it's just a pond which the, whereby the water does not run. On the basis of this, the South African government regulated, enacted or promulgated a regulation in terms of which it was compelled to put a ban on all initiation schools, in particular in, our, or in arranging, holding, or conducting any initiation practice. In this regard, the government implemented further measures, especially in the, in the context of initiation schools. These measures included that a person could not arrange or hold an initiation school or conduct one. Another measure was that a prospective initiate could not attend an initiation school and an owner could, could not, an owner of land could not provide consent for the use of his or a land for the purposes of holding an initiation school. The last one, the traditional surgeons or medical practitioners could not perform any circumcision as part of an initiation practice. These measures were only applicable between level five and level two of the lockdown. However, at level one, the initiation schools and practice were still prohibited nationally, but except in the Eastern Cape, because in this particular province, the traditional leaders or those, the stakeholders that made submissions to the, 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 the command council, the coronavirus command council that they will be able to adhere to all strict health protocols. So in this area, they were allowed to do that, a subject that they adhere to strict health protocols and social distancing measures. Though initiations were allowed in this pro province, but celebrations, post -cele initial celebrations were prohibited. This is because the, pro the celebrations were taken as super spreaders of the COVID-19 pandemic. So most of the leaders and the provincial house of traditional leaders were tasked with steps to ensure that these measures are implemented and are adhered to in all the communicate 
communities, particularly also in the Eastern Cape. It should be mentioned that in the regulation, anyone who offends or transgresses against any of these measures, they could be held liable in terms of a fine or imprisonment, or the school could be shut by the relevant authorities. So a bit, just a bit conclusion on this part, looking at it, it is, it is clear that it was the government that shut, shut, closed down all the initiation schools. And it was not the, 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 the view or an initiation that was taken by school conductors. In this regard, the government recognized the need to save lives of initiates and prevent further spread of the coronavirus. So now I'd like to move to the impact of our constitution on the prohibition of initiation schools. In this particular section I'm, of this paper, I'm looking at whether the measures that I've just mentioned, they are measures that are allowed in, are justifiable and reasonable in terms of section 36 of our constitution, which provides as follows. The rights in the Bill of Rights may be only limited in terms of general law of application to the extent that they are reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society based on human dignity, equality, and freedom, taking into account relevant factors such as the nature of the right, the purpose, the importance, and so on and so forth. Looking at the regulations, the way they are framed, and that they were supported by the, our National Disaster Act, it is it forms part or it qualifies as the law of general the, 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 the law of general application that can limit or impair or restrict the exercise or the enjoyment of certain rights. So looking at this, the right at stake here, it is the right to enjoy your particular culture of your own, which is also guaranteed by our constitution in terms of section 30 and 31. However, the right, it is not absolute. Like any other right, it can be limited in terms of section 36 of our constitution. So this will mean that customary law practice initiation it is subject to constitutional control and regulation. As such, initiation must be practiced in a manner that complies with constitutional rights contained in the Bill of Rights, especially the right to human dignity, the right to life, and the right to sufficient water. So looking, thank you, looking at how circumstances are in these particular schools, I would say that the, the regulations, they were, not, they, they, they were not unfair or they were reasonable and justifiable, particularly in terms of, particularly looking at how the government strived to ensure and protect or preserve the lives of initiates in light of the right to life. In conclusion, I would say that South Africa has indeed adopted far-reaching measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19. These measures in, involve the restriction of the right to culture as shown above. However, the national state of disaster such as the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, it, 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 it pushed our government to, to, to put forth some measures even though they were restrictive in a manner, but there were justifiable limitations of the right to enjoy cultural initiation in terms of section 26 of the constitution. This is because these measures, they have a legitimate purpose of protecting public health in terms as supported by our constitution and also the regulations in terms of section 27 to of the Disaster Management Act. And these regulations, they fall within the requirements of the law proportionality and reasonableness. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nguenyama, for that um, presentation. You exceeded your time by about 40 seconds or so, but that's fine. Um, um, but you still were able to, I'm, I'm a stickler for time, so pardon me for um, um, letting everybody know the time that they have used, because also we need to um, wrap up soon and all that. Um, let's move on now to the final presentation. Before um, I, I bring in um, the final presenter, I would encourage our attendees to use the Q&A button on Zoom to send in their questions. At this point, it could be a question on any of the presentations that you've heard 
or the one that is about to um, be delivered. And you can also bring your questions in on Facebook as well so that they can all be addressed during the Q&A session, which will happen in about 10 minutes um, time. So um, the next um, presenter um, is in the person of um, Luisa Acabado, who I, I hope I got your name right. Um, Almost right, Luisa Cabal, it's right, thank you. All right, we'll take it, all right. Um, she's a visiting researcher, I believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, at the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology. And she will be talking about the changing game of mirrors, customary law from the outside. So um, she's going to talk about um, um, customary law looking from the outside rather than from the inside. So um, I'll, I'll call on, um, um, you to go ahead right now. You have 10 minutes to make your presentation. Thank you. Uh, let me just say I'm actually based in the Center for Social Studies in Coimbra at the University of Coimbra in Portugal. Okay. Um, it's a short uh, visit at the Max Planck. Um, and my presentation, let me just start to share my screen. It's if it's okay. And uh, my presentation is actually part of my ongoing PhD research. So it's a pleasure to be included with so many distinguished speakers. I've learned a lot uh, for the last hours. And my presentation discusses the engagement of development cooperation with customary justice. That's why I named it from the outside and this contribution to ongoing processes of negotiation on the value and place of diversity in Guinea-Bissau. So uh, firstly, hmm. firstly, I will briefly refer to the Bissau-Guinean context for those of you that are not familiar with it. And I shall then speak about the project of collection and codification of Kosumari law that took place between 2008 and 2011 and became part of the ongoing negotiation on the value of the customary within the state. Finally, if I have the time, I'll build upon my ethnography on recent activities undertaken within development cooperation engagements with customary justice to describe recent practices of negotiation and a construction of narratives regarding the realm of the customary in Guinea-Bissau. So basically, there's a multiplicity of justice practices in Guinea-Bissau, uh, pervasiveness of customary law on the everyday lives of Bissau Guineans, and an unclear legal approach towards its value within the legal system. And this is a very important point because it leads to a strong legal pluralism. Um, the Bissau Guinean state legal order is very complex with four different sources of law and legal value of custom although absent from the constitution is set on the civil code. So um, when not contrary to principles of good faith, it may be taken in consideration as determined by law and several legal acts refer to custom. Recent research also unveils how Bissau Guinean justice system are marked by heterogeneity and hybridization by the existence of foreign shopping and by individual legal pluralism. So actually the knowledge of norms and institutions of different ethnic groups allows individuals to compare norms and then to assess advantages and disadvantages of each system and to combine them. And different non-state systems actually are um, commonly assembled under the concept of a traditional justice and or customary justice. Literature emphasizes also a diversity of our new players and legal perceptions concurring with what is conventionally seen as traditional authorities or customary justice, such as disputing parties, the police, imams, the radio, associations of inhabitants, youth organizations, even tourists may have a, a, a role as dispute settlers. Against this background, I want to mention the way in which the project of collection and codification of customary law is also in line with earlier colonial programs of research in Guinea-Bissau. So the project was designed under the leadership of the Law School of Bissau, which fundraised from the United Nations and the European Union. And before the independence of Guinea-Bissau in 1973, uh, Portuguese colonial ethnography had researched extensively on indigenous practices 
and the significant part of that research program was oriented towards the political will to have an indigenous code of justice. This 2008-2011 project was actually in line with these um, attempts. Its main objective was to have a codification, a manual that would help judges to apply customary law. But by that time, the European Union and the United Nations had planned to undertake research on Bissau Guinean social legal reality. This project resulted in two publications, um, Customary Law in Force in the Republic uh, of Guinea-Bissau, which is a 600 pages uh, matrix of comparison, and a final report. Concerning the objectives of the project, um, the report says there was this need to know traditional conflict resolution practice of the main ethnic groups to strengthen the interconnections between formal and informal justice. One of the responsible officers from the European Union recalled the project as something new that had never been attended before in an African country, which I, I believe that we all know that is not true. In a recent article, the coordinator of the project assumed a revelation stance, considering the project to have undertaken the task of revealing and written law in force. Concerning the methodology of this uh, codification, it results from uh, 11 different questionnaires with 809 questions that were applied to an unknown number of people for, from 29 villages. The surveys used for this data collection were based on state law. Um, the selection of villages to collect data was done according to previous experiences with a problematic assumption that some villages would provide better data than others that raises a problem of representation that was not solved through the methods that were used for data collection. Actually, data was collected during open meetings where Connoisseurs, I would say, in legal matters, would speak about their custom through a jumbai, that is a, a Creole, a Bissau Guinean Creole expression for something similar to a focus group. Concerning the content of the book, and here we have an image of the first page of the book that I chose to, to, to speak about, and this is a subsection that speaks about Balenta, that is an active group, traditional power structures. So here, the question is who is competent to decide and organize and manage community issues as defined on the right hand of, the, of this matrix. And we can read that according to Balenta custom, the power to decide, organize and manage, as well as to trial conflicts belongs to the chief of the household at the household level, to the chief of the village or the village committee at the village level and the most important issues would be taken to a council of elders. And we can also read on the other side of the, of the matrix that within state law in force, it would correspond to administrative entities within a logic similar to local government. And these entities are then listed, listed according to the structure of, of local power that is foreseen by the constitution even if these uh, local power institutions were never implemented because local elections were never held in Guinea-Bissau. So first, this example on the comparison, the comparison between the state and the Balenta village so shows us a Balenta village that is essentialized as a segmentary society. So this imagine this image of democratic rule of law defined against the image of somehow an ordered primitivism is both, uh, in my opinion, and belated colonial gaze and also a post-colonial fiction. It reminds also the occurrence of colonial mimesis as explained by Tosic. The, these researchers could not go beyond their own categories, but their own categories are a description of uh, law in books without a reality check. And so does the description of the Balenta village that I would call like a law in voices. But the Balenta village is not the only essentialized reality here. There is also a simulation of the state itself so through the description of existing legislation that has never been applied in practice. Therefore, this, uh, this first row of the matrix shows a, a fictitious comparison between fictitious realities. I would also uh, highlight how different community-based uh, organizations 
are assembled under the concept of traditional power. In fact, this first cell of the matrix assembles different power logics. It assembles chiefs with committees, which is actual a, a political um, institution. Okay, I have to worry. Um, and also with spiritual um, uh, entities. But most of these uh, reflections are extensible to ongoing activities. So in June 2019, within the framework of a peace building project, I observed this five days training section on customary law and conflict resolution that was actually held in a location where the ethnic prevalence would allegedly be this Belanta ethnic group. The training envisaged two groups of trainees, Belanta people belonging to traditional power structures and people from state power structures of the area. So according to the project guidelines, people belonging to traditional power structures are described as being traditional and religious leaders, opinion leaders, and also representatives from um, NGOs and civil society organizations. So um, we can actually question how dynamic is this category and how do international organizations contribute to its flexibility? And we can question how this kind of events, like workshops convened by international organizations and NGOs or even the state institutions themselves, contribute to the recomposition of the category through the recognition of new players. So basically, this profiling of participants continues the ongoing reconstitution of players in the realm of traditional power structures. Uh, but the training was also a privileged space for the construction of the narrative regarding the Balenta customary law itself. And during the discussion, there were several examples that I won't have exactly the time to, to, to describe, where uh, people would uh, disagree with the conclusions that were in the book. And they would disagree with the several different, uh, in the several different situations. So just to conclude, um, most of these critics are obviously not new. Literature also highlights how most of international agencies, um, uh, their urge to reform non-state legal orders is driven by a quest for uniformity and standardization, contributing to replicate a kind of weak legal pluralism. And also literature draws a parallel with colonial indirect forms of rule, considering that today such politics uh, tend to be masked by a universalizing discourse of international rule of law uh, programming. So I have tried to mention um, how uh, and to show how the ongoing negotiation of narratives concerning the customary and how this negotiation still mirrors a colonial divide. So I'm sorry because I think I'm um, a little off my time. Thank you. Thank you, um, Luisa Cabado, for that presentation. Um, we, yes, um, you exceeded your time, but it's fine. Um, we're running a tight schedule here, but I believe um, all our panelists can have the opportunity to chip in during the Q&A, which we are about to begin um, now. And so um, at this point in time, if um, there are some questions are on the Q&A um, button that I would ask, I would respectfully ask that the panelists switch on their video um, so that they can address the questions when they are directed to them. But before I move on to um, the questions that we have um, on the q and I have a few questions that um, I'd like to ask and see if the panelists can chip in depending on um, the question. First and foremost, um, Professor, um, Zongwe, since um, you were the first um, to take a bite at um, in terms of your presentation, you talked about um, excavating communal trust, and you talked about the fact that trust um, emanates from both um, um, contract as economic exchanges generally and personal status, um, for example, within the community. So my question then um, is um, that how do you, and you also obviously touch on um, the African um, continental free trade area, which is something that has been of importance, especially for the purposes of commerce um, in Africa generally, and the potential that it has to unify, if we may put it that way, the African continent in terms of trade. But um, what do you think, or how do you see customary law 
affecting this African continental free trade area in any way? Do you see it playing any role? How do we navigate that terrain? Because of obviously we know um, the nature of customary law and how um, formal law, so to speak, seems to be the dominant um, factor in some of these things. So what's your, your sense of, on that? So your question, if I understand it correctly, is that you want to see how, um, let's say, um, customary law or let's say customary contracting can influence um, uh, intra, intra African trade. Yes. Uh, actually, yes. Different, yes. sorry? Yes, essentially, yes. Yeah, in different ways. Um, one way, uh, well, there are more than two ways, but one way is uh, actually in making that statement, I was drawing on historical evidence that the law merchant, in other words, um, mercantile law uh, played an important role in actually fueling foreign trade. So um, the, African, um, Af the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement is creating the framework for more intra-African trade. But many of that intra-African trade will actually happen between private individuals who may actually exchange goods and services uh, informally and in doing so, they may rely on the, uh, let's say, customary practices in terms of the exchange. But it is also, so it's, it, those are the two ways, through the informality of cross-border transaction, but also because historically there is evidence that the law merchant has actually fueled foreign trade. Um, and in fact, if you look at the old uh, structure of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, there is a big space given to, um, private sector development. So we're not necessarily talking about the big companies and so forth. It can be actually uh, just individuals. And one of the realities um, um, in Africa, and we see it in different um, countries, is that the borders were drawn uh, arbitrarily, which means that people from the same ethnic group actually may find themselves on, on two sides of the same border, but they actually have kept their um, traditional um, values and their practices. So you, we, we can see through this kind of exchange um, the promotion, for example, of communal trust, because when uh, dealing with one another informally or even formally, but in the same, let's say, traditional community, you would actually have uh, instances where people would be relying more on relationship as opposed, on the, uh, as opposed to transactions. They would be emphasizing more things like reciprocity and interdependence rather than just uh, the mere pursuit of, uh, of profit, which is actually at the core of the neoliberal that have been denouncing, uh, neoliberal neoliberalism that have been denouncing, and that we found in modern um, uh, commercial law. So I don't know if that uh, you're satisfied with this answer or whether you want um, more clarification. But was it clear? No, it's absolutely clear. It's, it, it, it's clear. And I mean, I want to bring in um, Nena at this point, just following up from the point that you make um, about how to harmonize. Um, these sorts of things within the framework of the AF, CFTA and all that. Nena, you talked a lot about um, digitalization and um, technology. Um, we having to embrace um, technology within this age that we are in and then customary law essentially needed to adapt to um, some of these things. So the question that I had for you was how, for instance, can we advance this course on um, African customary law and technology. And um, if you want to um, dovetail that into a question that has been posed specifically um, to you on the Q&A from Abiola Innes, who suggests or who asks that, are there any policy propositions for the use of technology in the harmonization of customary law? So if you could just um, um, address those two and then situate it within the context of the discussion that we are having, especially in terms of digital, digitalization and commercialization within the framework of the AFCT um, FA, the African Continental Free Trade Area. Thank you, Kweku. And um, I must say that um, there is hardly research in this area in terms of, and one of the things I intend to address in a full paper is policy proposition. Unfortunately, there is nothing in terms of policy directly focused on harmonization of African customary law um, through technology. Now, last year in 2020, the African Union proposed the African Digital Transformation Agenda for 2020 to 2030. 
Unfortunately, if you go through the entire document, there are focus, it's focused on health, entrepreneurship, cybersecurity. There's hardly anything about reforming the, you know, the judicial sector. Now, the main focus of my paper and why I'm making this call is to ensure that as we focus on reforming the legal and judicial sector, you know, to suit these contemporary realities or standards of judicial of the digital age, we must also not relegate African customary law in terms of reforms. There have been trainings for judges, for example. These trainings are focused on what Professor Diala called, you know, the imposed English system and how to advance. There are hardly trainings on, you know, e-judicial system, you know, e-discovery or things like that in terms of um, African customary law. Now, there are lots of challenges because, you know, asking about about how do we advance um, those issues. There is so much of challenges. And one of the things I will tackle on in my paper as well is the digital divide. The fact that you know, those in these areas, for example, those in those areas, how do they you know, assess this te technologies? How would the law be you know, available to them through these technologies? And I must add that one basic way, you know, aside policy, aside everything we've talked about, is a human rights based approach and you know I was particularly interested when Professor Andulo was talking about human rights and African customary law. The fact that you know we can't discuss rules, laws, you know, customs in absentia, you know, of um, what is social change. And I think that is why we must think about a human rights based approach in terms of understanding how these technologies apply peculiarly. Now for an African, access to justice will be different from what access to justice means for someone else in another jurisdiction. One of the presenters reminded us, I think Dr. Kamala, about the Maputo systems. We must think about technologies and this is why a stakeholder approach consultation you know, with traditional leaders saying this is what these needs are. I'm thinking about succession and inheritance. I'm thinking about ownership rights for women. How do we reflect this in technology? So as we go on, hopefully there will be those policy propositions for now. There is so much silence about reforming Africa um, customary law through technology. There's nothing being said about it. But in terms of the judicial legal sector, there is so much being discussed about technological advancement and digitalization and digital transformation. So I think academia has a role to play. Research has a huge role to play in advancing you know, policy changes in advancing um, policy directions as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, Nana, for, for tying it in nicely. And I think um, just so everybody has a bite at um, this, Sherry, before we see if we can get um, some other questions, I'd like to bring um, in at this point Professor Diala, because Professor Diala in his presentation um, tries to make a distinction between um, what, first and foremost, you set out um, five your five claims. Um, which you you intend to or you intended to go on to um, to establish, and then, but generally, one thing that I picked up from your presentation is that you try to draw a distinction between what you term, I believe, indigenous customary law on one hand and African customary law on the other hand. And correct me um, if I'm wrong, but that's that's the impression that I get, or that's one of the things I got um, from um, the presentation. So, um, if within that context. The, there's a specific question that I believe is directed um, to you um, by Linda Osaji um, on the Q&A. And she's asking that um, customary laws or customary law and its practice is marginalized by the received laws or imposed laws as you opined, which is basically or which is based on the foundation um, for the state's laws and, and formation of the constitution. So how can some fine points of our customary law be pushed upscale and be enshrined in the constitution, seeing that the constitution in Nigeria and other African states is the grown norm, the highest law um, of the land generally. And um, before you respond to that question, um, Dr. Larato in Guanyama, this also may be something that you may want to touch on because of the fact that you make reference to the constitution and how there is, um, there is um, 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 some practices, initiation, practices that the constitution um, sought to prevent or, or there is some leeway within um, that context, obviously for human rights um, purposes and all that. So if you can synthesize um, your arguments within the context of the question after um, Professor um, um, Diala takes a bite at it, please. Thank you, Dr. Um, 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 Dr.
things. So, Prof. It's Prof. Diallo. All right. Yes. Thank you, Linda, for that question, because it, it raises an important element of my presentation that I failed to point out. When we speak of legal integration, in fact, when we speak of ascertaining customary laws or indigenous laws, we are not saying go and ascertain the substantive laws. I think someone mentioned it here. I'm not sure if it is Professor Ndulo. Yeah, um, mentioned it here that you ascertain the values of indigenous law or the values of customary law. So now I've called these values because of their importance, I've called them foundational values. So they are the values that inspired these customs to emerge in the first place. Um, just, I crave your indulgence to just give you an example from marriage. In the pre-colonial past, when communities, like I said, lived close together, families lived close together, we did not have the technology we had today, no roads, so lots of forests. People did not have much contact with the outside world. A young man who wanted to marry would not know, would not have anyone in mind to marry because he cannot marry from his own community. He can't marry his sisters, his cousins. So he has to marry from a neighboring community. And having no contact with the outside world, he would go to, the, to, the, to his father or to the elders in the family and, in, and inform them, I need to marry. They said, okay, fine. Do you have anyone in mind? He will say, how can I have anyone in mind? Nobody. Don't worry, we'll find a wife for you. The elders will make inquiries in the neighboring community they will send out emissaries, determine the character ETC. And then because wealth, farming, agriculture, hunting, everything was done, family wealth was produced together. The family will also raise the bride wealth, the ilobolo. So they will raise it for the young man. And then when the woman is married, some ceremonies, some rituals will accompany the marriage. And the lobola that was raised, the bride wealth will be used to replace the services. So the family that received that lobola will replace the services of the young woman who left their family by marrying someone for one of their sons. So you now see that the family is heavily involved in marriage. That was the pre-colonial settings. Now the settings have changed. We have individualistic income, people earning income individually. We have um, people going to the town, meeting people and then bringing them home that they want to marry. But some communities will still, will still insist on sharing in some of the bride wealth, the cattle and the rest of them that's provided now is monetized and cash, it is, they will still insist on it and they will cling or cite tradition. But many of them will not know that the social settings that prompted that heavy family involvement in marriage are no more in many African communities. So family involvement in marriage is a value of indigenous law. Preservation of the ancestral home is a value in indigenous law. The welfare of the family is a value in the law of um, succession, inheritance. There are so many other examples. I published a paper where I gave examples of these values. If we want to ascertain customary law, we start from these values. After ascertaining these values, what do we do next? We export it to the judiciary, make sure that judges embrace them. After judges embrace them, what next? We make sure that these values start replacing the values in the Bill of Rights. Because these values resonate with the communal spirit of African laws. We start replacing the values in the Bill of Rights with indigenous values, with foundational values. And then finally, what's the next step? We incorporate these values in the constitution. And as a lengthy period of time passes and less conflict is emphasized and more dialogue between indigenous laws and state laws, go on, eventually we can adopt legislation integrating customary law with the imposed laws. And then, like I said, the final step is the emergence of a common law in African countries, just as it emerged in the global north. All right, thank you. So quickly, if Lerato, Dr. Nguanyama, you can chip in and then um, Louisa Akabado, you also have a bite at this and looking at it um, from the context of conflict resolution, um, how um, conflict resolution within the customary law um, setting, if it is something that we can modernize or if there's a need um, to modernize it in any way to achieve the ends of contemporary, the contemporary issues and contemporary um, problems that we have. If you can each take a minute because our time is far gone, but I still want to give everyone the opportunity um, to, to react to this particular question. So Dr. Nguanyama, you have one minute and then Dr. Um, um, Luisa Cabado would also um, um, chip in before we, we wrap up, please. Thank you, sir. 
the argument that I was trying to flag out in the paint promulgates regulations, these regulations should always be checked whether they're in line with the constitution, whether they are reasonable, justifiable, and acceptable within the ambit of the constitution, because the constitution is the supreme law of the country. So always when the government enacts something, for instance, it was in this context, in my, the context of my paper, it was many have seen that the regulations, they somehow restrict the right to culture. So I was trying to check or evaluate whether it, that perception was correct or in does the, do the regulations really impact on the right to culture, but looking at how the regulations were promulgated, that is to save or to preserve lives in light of the right to lives. So the argument that I'm saying is that the regulations, they are, they are justifiable, they are reasonable, and they are necessary in order to preserve or to promote respect and protect constitutional rights or the Bill of Rights, such as the right to life. Okay, all right. All right, very, very well. Um, Louisa, you have the last word. Thank you. Though from my perspective, customary law is permanently modernizing. And that's why also I, I look with uh, some, I think it's a, a big challenge to try to codify it somehow. Uh, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but uh, it's, it's against the, the nature of customary law. So, uh, and it would have, we would have to have a, a big reflection on the methods that are used for that. And maybe technology actually can play a role here. Uh, but, um, but that's uh, basically my perspective. Thank you. Oh, all right. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And um, I'd like to um, first and foremost, apologize to our panelists for um, not being able to start on time and not being able to give you enough time to expand on the many interesting themes that you, um, you, you obviously had. We look forward to seeing um, your papers being developed and being published subsequently because um, I believe from where I sit, it was a lot the knowledge in the field as we are learning that a lot of these things are not documented in a way that we should so that the education um, is out there. So thank you once again. And on behalf of the Center um, of African Legal Studies at the University of Professional Studies at Accra um, Law School or School of Law, um, we would like to thank you all for taking time to join us today to present your and very diverse papers within the context of the panel. Um, that we have. Thank you so much um, on behalf of the UPS Law School, the Center of African Legal Studies, as well as um, the Leitner Center um, for International Law and Justice, which is also um, um, a, co a sponsoring partner to this for this conference. We'd like to thank you um, very well. We look forward to your papers and we look forward to um, collaborating and the conversation um, will go on beyond this um, conference and will lead to some fruitful collaborations and some um, impact in terms of customary law in Africa generally. So on my own behalf, um, I'd like to thank you all and I'll hand us back over um, to the MC for the closing um, ceremony or session um, to be done. So I'll urge all of you to stay um, whilst we close the conference. So over to you, um, Gertrude, I believe. Thank you so much, Dr. Ajimambudu. Um, wonderful panel by our standards, excellent moderation, I must say. Um, what, a high, what a high note on which to, to end uh, the proceedings in this conference. And uh, I want to hand over to Professor Paolo Galizzi for his closing remarks. Prof, if you can hear me. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Um, I'm not gonna be long, but first of all, I wanted to thank the organizers and the people really behind this conference. Things don't just happen even in a digital age, you still need human beings to do an awful lot of work. And sometimes in a digital age, some things are easier and some things are much harder. Connectivity issues, tracking people down and so on and so forth. There's been an awful lot going on over the past two days, but we made it. And we made thank you, not just to digital, but to human beings. And the human beings that I really want to thank are um, Benedicta Lassi, who joined us as director of the center to really work 24 seven to make this happen. 
Mensa, we had to go back to teach because we overrun our time, get through the armor, Joe Bafour and Dina Bucci, all of us that really work on this. This wouldn't have happened without you. Secondly, I want to thank the participants. Without all the wonderful speakers that we had, the moderator, there would be no conference. So thank you and an apology for giving you less time that you deserved. You see, we are used to conferences in person where you can pull people by the hand, you can take the microphone, you have all sort of signaling to say your time is up. Digitally, I think we're still trying to figure out a few things. You see, we're still trying to adapt to the new reality that hopefully will not be with us for too long, because hopefully it'd be wonderful to talk about customer law in Africa by actually being in Africa. And I'm looking forward, I'm not there obviously, for those who are there to be in the same place, all of us together. But let me say just a few things because I don't wanna keep you here for too long. Another apology about the failure of the customary tradition at the end of the conference after all this work, it is tradition, I think everywhere in the world to go and get a drink together, to have a conversation. So what I would hope everybody can do, have a drink with us on your own, reflecting upon what we've done. Because I think you all deserve at least a drink, particularly for staying here until this late. On a more substantive note though, I think this conference has demonstrated that African customary law is alive and kicking. There's a huge interest. There's a lot to discuss. There's a huge debate. The second thing, I think that the future of African customary law and of Africa academia is really bright. I've heard from several scholars, including young province scholar, with interesting ideas. And I think the debates that we've been having are very fruitful. And it doesn't mean that we all need to agree on whether it is customary law or customary laws or indigenous or any other terminology. I think the debate is very fruitful. And I thought that customary law has brought on a very robust academic conversation met by practical debate. Because at the end of the day, one thing that is important, African customary law, more important than everything, is real for most and most people in the African continent. When I go in certain communities, there is no state, there is no police, there's just customary law. And what customary law does and says really determines who you can marry, who goes to prison, who goes to court, who gets land, and so on and so forth. And therefore, I think, we can have different views about where this is going, whether we would like it to go in a direction or another, but that's a debate that is worth having. And lastly, what I would say is that we shouldn't wait another 11 years for the next conference. We did a conference in 2009 in Botswana. We did one in 2020, sorry, 2021. You see, I'm losing track of time with this COVID situation. We should do a conference much sooner with all the people that really participated. And we are glad that we still have uh, the honorable chief, vice president of the Pan-African Parliament, so we can appeal to the African Union for support to really, really invest, A, in young academics, in academics in general, and in really having a dialogue about customary law, where is it going? You see, to me, laws are not good or bad or neutral. It really depends on who makes them, who interprets them, who applies them. It's not for me to decide where customary law is going, but I hope it stays, I hope it strengthens, I hope it adapts, I hope it changes, because if we don't change, and that's the title of this conference, we will not survive. And if we guide the change, then customary law will be more relevant and stronger than ever. On this note, thank you everybody. Please go and have the drink on all of us and hopefully we'll see you all very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for Sakaliti. I am definitely going to have that drink or maybe two. Um, on this note, I'd like to say a very big thank you to all our moderators, uh, our presenters, as well as our participants. Thank you so much for taking time with your busy schedules and joining us for the African Customary Law Conference. It has been an exciting and enlightening two days, 
And I'm so happy and glad that everything went so well. From us at the UPSA Law School here in Ghana, and I'm sure from the Lightner Center in the United States of America, Fordham Law School, thank you so much. Do have a, a wonderful day and see you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>